I've heard enough. New arrival screams echoing through the hallway to know that this ain't good. Once they pass them through the infierno, they don't come back. It's enough to make you go crazy. Do not think we fear you, spirit. We know your power is born of evil. This is your last night in the land of the living. You understand me, Malabon Demon? that lived here called the Hetheringtons, and unfortunately, their daughter passed away of a heart attack inside the house. Basically, they were so devastated that they reached out to people claiming to be psychic mediums. They actually weren't psychic mediums. They opened up a total of 11 portals inside this house and invited spirits and entities from all different kinds of dimensions. Well, I think there are certain pieces of evidence that there is an afterlife. The resurrection of the dead is affirmed uh, pretty clearly uh, in the Talmud and the Midrash. To be honest with you, to give this lecture is a nightmare. If it was up to me, I wouldn't. There's going to be some graphic details. This place is a maze. The person after death went to a place called Sheol. This is by far the largest near-death experience study that has ever been conducted. People go to a place and they experience weird things. And sometimes they actually will see a character of some type. Well, where did that come from? I don't know why that one chain is swinging back there. They may describe feeling profoundly peaceful, seeing a bright, warm, welcoming light. Some people describe watching doctors and nurses working on them with incredible accuracy. Next thing I knew, I was above my body watching the operation. How long did you feel like you were gone? I went to a place of timelessness. And so what that means, it could have been a second. It could have been five minutes. I don't know. Can you imagine waking up from your sleep and not being able to move? As I'm lying there, I realized that there's a, an evil presence next to me. Do you believe that angels, demons exist? Holy oh, dude, get out of here! Oh my god, dude! Strange things keep happening. Bizarre nightmares, as if I'm on fire. <gasps> Whoa, what the hell is this? Man, I've got bad chest pain. Satan's Hollow is what it's called, the portal to hell. Some people calling it an eye of fire, while others said it looked like the portal to hell opening up. And the next thing I know, I was outside of my body. 
not looking at my body. What I'm going to do is called claromancy, the art of throwing lots or throwing bones. 2,000 years of experience passed down, recorded, of how demons work. God has them all on a leash, and he lets the leash go enough to let them tempt us because that's what makes us spiritually stronger. I'm trying to be as graphic as possible so you understand what we're talking about. It's your ticket to reality. It's your ticket to freedom. It's your ticket to immortality. Is there an afterlife? Is there a it's God? It's the type of information that can keep you away from yourself. What happens to us after we die? There's no way to escape the subject of Gainal. Most people don't believe in Gainal. The subject of punishment, the subject of reward, the subject of Gan Eden, and the subject of Gainal are very much a critical part of the Torah. Most people never heard anything about it. Maybe they heard a few little stories here and there, and they say, no, it's not really real. They ask their rabbi, what about Gainal? Oh, no, it's a washing machine. But unfortunately, the Western world has been telling you guys that the most important thing you need to know about Gainom and punishment in general and Shemaim is the busha, embarrassment. Well, I'm gonna go through the books. My goal is not necessarily just to give you guys nightmares. I've been trying not to do it. If it was up to me, I wouldn't do it. But in a generation where most people think that Yirat Shemaim is a curse word or is politically incorrect, a place there's no leader, at least try to be one. So the goal of today's shiur that in no place does it say that you should be worried about Gainom because of the Busha? That you should be worried of Gainom because it's a washing machine? This is a figment of our politically correct mind. This is what we would like for it to be. This is as far from the truth as possible. We'd like for it to be that we could go against the Shem, eat whatever moves, whatever doesn't move, dress like prostitutes, steal like thieves, violate Hashem's name on a day-to-day -day basis, but we only have for 70, 80, 120 years, we only have 12 months to suffer for it. And it's not really that big of a suffering, so you're embarrassed for a year, me skin. I haven't found that in the books. I'll try to give you as many page numbers and book names and so on as possible. I'll try to make it as fluid as possible, and Be'ezat Hashem will succeed to develop a little bit of Yirat Shemaim. There's gonna be some graphic details.
I'm not gonna go over into every single detail that happens over there because there's not enough time in a day to do it. If I explain to you what happens in one of the Madurim, just one, the seven, time will end and we will not be finished. What Rabbi Yisrael Misalan said, if they simply understood the fire of Gehenno, not in the worst level, the seventh level that doesn't end, but Gemara Masechet Rosh Shana, page 17a, says that the Mashiach will come, the resurrection of the dead will happen, the world would end, but that Gehenno will not end. If people just understood the magnitude of the fire in the first level, they would say, you know what, Hashem, don't give us any reward. Just don't take us there. It's enough that I don't go to Gainum for a moment as a reward for 120 years of doing mitzvot and kaparat avonot and suffering your whole life. It's enough. Just to not go there. No Ganeidim. No reward. Nothing. One of the Mahamarim, it says Rabbi Akiva one time, he was able to see things that most people cannot. And he saw a person running back and forth, collecting wood. Now this person looked disheveled. He looked distraught, he was full of smoke, he was full of injuries, and he was carrying wood back and forth and running fast as if someone's chasing him, but he doesn't see anyone chasing him. He tried telling him to stop. He didn't stop. I had taken um, a video of what looked to be like a shadow figure walking around across the street in the woods. And it's, it's looking directly out my front window, so it's a little hard not to notice. This is the area where we see the figure. It just walks back and forth every day, all day. Now, I've been over there a couple of times um, as I walk up on it. There's just nothing there. What appears to be a person pacing back and forth for just hours and hours and days. I think today's like day five. This went on for days and he paces back and forth for hours and hours, not not just for 20 minutes at a time. This is hours and hours and hours and days, weeks. I mean, here we are a month and a half later and it's been still there. You see it? It just walks back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's no camera tricks. I. 44-year-old mother of three, I have no clue how to use this stuff. The schut of the Torah, I command you to stop. And the man stopped and says, who are you? And what are you doing here? And why do you keep carrying wood? He says, this is my punishment. I am in Kafa Kela. I made sins in my life and my unfortunate punishment is that I have to collect wood so they could burn me with this wood in the morning and then they can burn me again at night. They burn me into ashes and I feel more pain times 60 of what you think is pain. And then I go into ashes and I go to nothing. And then they bring me back. And then I go chase wood again to go burn myself again. This is from Rabbi Akiva. We all need to know it. Because the Gemara in Masechet Brachot says, when someone has the Yetzirah come to him, say Kriyat Shema. So remember there's a God. If that doesn't work, you still want to go out with the Goya. You still want to go out with the Goy. You still want to eat non-kosher. You still want to be not modest. You still want to do this. You still want to go against the Shem for whatever reason or another. It says, learn Torah. It reminds you you're not allowed to do it. If that doesn't work, the Gemara says, what I do now, it says, remind them the day is going to die. Once you actually know what happens when you die, you don't need any So the first thing a person needs to know is realize that he's not going to be here forever. So the Geshe Lechaim talks to, about the halachot of what happens when someone dies. The halachot of cleaning the dead. It's all going to happen. You're all going to go through it at some point. When a person is extra proud of their looks and their money and their intellect and all the things that they have physically, you should know that at some point you're going to be like a little turkey. So next time you're overconfident, next time you're arrogant, next time you want to show off, just remember you're going to be that. But that should help you with your arrogance. It helps me. In reality, what are you so proud of? Something that's going to be mukse one day? After someone goes into the grave, the grave, according to Allah, should be one and a quarter meters deep. You have to put the legs first and then the head. If anyone ever experienced or saw a funeral, it's a disaster, it's a traumatizing experience, regardless of what religion it is, but even more so in Judaism. In other religions, sometimes they burn it, so some crazy people put that stuff in their house, the ashes in their house. Other people put it in tombs. The tombs are, they look like, you know, very expensive apparently. 
But in Judaism, we don't have those things. In Judaism, when they put somebody in a tomb, it literally looks like a sack of potatoes. That's going to be us. I'm trying to be as graphic as possible so you understand what we're talking about here. Anyone that saw it should be traumatized a little bit. If you haven't seen it, most people have the same conclusion as you. That's it. The end. Finished. Guy finished. He lived 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. Done. He's finished. Not so. The Torah Kedusha says this is when life begins. The moment a person's eyes close, the moment the neshama leaves the body, there's no more doubts. There's no more questions. There's no more suffix. There's no more, I'm not so sure. There's no more of that. The moment your neshama leaves the body, the moment the person passes away, they know everything. And they know what they're expecting. Consciousness seems to survive death for these people who experience a near-death experience. You investigated people who were blind from birth and the first and only time they ever regained sight was during a near-death experience or that you published a medical survey with thousands of participants. Can we recap a little bit about that evidence that you uncovered? So I've been collecting data now for over 17 years. We had a very detailed survey asking the near-death experiencers a great many questions so that we could learn not only from a large number of near-death experiencers, but learn in depth what happened during their near-death experience. This is by far the largest near-death experience study that has ever been conducted. As we were coming through a intersection, the light was red and I was slowing down to stop. Then the next thing I knew, I was in a different place. It was kind of like sheer material all around me. It was a light and it was like a golden color. It was really warm. I was dead or nearly dead for about 20 minutes. What happened was uh, initially I found myself suspended in a place where there was no place. It was just, I, I felt the presence of my body and a grayness or just suspension and nothing. And as I wondered about what was around me, I saw in front of me start to envelop this light that coalesced. Couldn't tell the distance to the light. It was infinite and there was nothing. No dimensions, no time, no space, no thing. <laughs> it was not something my mind could, could wrap itself around. I then started to see this light that was incredibly bright, it didn't hurt my eyes. And all the physical pain and everything that was going on back in the room sort of disappeared. And, and as I was moving towards this light, I saw a triangle of people. And as I spoke, I then heard someone say, it's not time to go yet. And I was back in my body, literally, as I went out, the reverse. And everything was done through the mind. There was no talking. I could hear what the doctor was doing and I can't tell you how long because there was no clock on the wall or how serious the doctor was about finishing his surgery. I watched him cut me here and here and tear a tendon out and I started watching him put me back together. And I was sitting right up here above watching the surgery. Come to find out, it pronounced me dead for 20 minutes. I succumbed to the final stages of hypothermia. Peripheral vision began to fill in with black. This thing rushed right to me and communicated, I'm taking you and plucked me right out of myself and carried me up through with a proverbial tunnel. This is a place of timelessness, which means all time and no time, all time in one space and no time whatsoever. It's really hard to describe it. I created my own hell and I was going through this suffering of all the suffering I gave away. I also judged myself. How long do you think you were gone and how long did you feel like you were gone? Well, I don't know either. I didn't have a watch on me. Yeah, I went to a place of timelessness. And so what that means, it could have been a second. Could have been five minutes. I don't know. One morning waking up, I felt my heart beating real fast. I went off into a coma-like state. I felt myself drifting. I was begging not to die. It was one thing to see the light, but then to hear the, hear the voices. One telling me just to come on, and one telling me, I'll give you another chance. And so at that point, I thought to make a commitment to God, if he allowed me to live, that I will live for him to, until the day I die. I just wasn't ready at that time. That's important because that allows us to have more confidence than ever in these groundbreaking conclusions that we'll be talking about today. We could be crystal clear from very careful inspection that yes, this is a near-death experience, it really happened. 
Did you have a religious agenda? Absolutely not. I just wanted to know the truth. When I had my experience, I was a true atheist. I didn't believe in any kind of religion. I was up on a bucket truck. We were running some electrical lines. Kind of bumped into a tree. I hit the bucket and I broke all my ribs. I was sent to an emergency room and I was really struggling to breathe at one point. And then I got this tremendous sense of fear because I thought when I die, there's nowhere for me to go. I didn't believe in anything. I would just be shut off like a light bulb and just turn into nothingness. And then I, I noticed this shadow by the door and it just stood there. And then I felt myself kind of being lifted until I found myself in the corner of the room. I was observing the effort, the CPR team, the group that was there trying to save my life. And then I could see this huge hole in the ground, like a big black hole. And and we walk right into it and then I feel like I'm falling. And it was a bit of a painful experience because I feel like something was being ripped off of me. And there was another one. And I went into that hole and I fell and I kept falling and I felt this thing just being things off of me. And it felt like I was falling forever. I set out with that commitment that whatever I was going to find, I was going to publish wherever that path would go. To my somewhat astonishment, as I kept digging into near-death experiences that were aware of or encountered God, I was amazed once again at the consistency of what was being described. Uh, I have 277 near-death experiences that either were aware of or encountered God. It's not a small study. So I just really wanted to publish what I found. There's no religious agenda at all with this. And in fact, that if near-death experiences are for real, this changes my view of the universe. Now, you said that atheists have these experiences. Yeah, indeed, they do. Why? why? I mean, it, presumably, they don't believe in angelic beings. No, they don't believe in angelic beings. Uh, we have uh, two atheists in our series. Well, if you were an atheist, you'd interpret the experience as you see it. And our first atheist refused any sort of being in the experience. What they did was they dissolved into pure energy and they floated through a blue environment with pure energy to the light. And they had the same experience of the overwhelming feelings of love. And then the experience ended. The other one was very similar, but this time there were more people who they met and they met dead relatives, which is very common in their death experiences. So the fact that you don't believe anything is going to happen doesn't stop it happening. I was amazed, especially among people that encountered God, virtually everybody that had a near-death experience and encountered God shifted to believing that God absolutely is real. How long were you underwater? Well, so they are very clear that they believe I was underwater without oxygen for 30 minutes. I felt my spirit peeling away from my body and I could feel then my spirit rise up and out of the river. They pulled me out, started CPR, and kept calling to me to come back and take a breath. And I'd interrupt our progress, I'd go back down this path, lie down, take a breath, and then rejoin. I eventually did make it to this threshold. Really one of the things that uh, was a great surprise to me was an absolute sense of being home. And I had a great life. I was not trying to escape something. I had everything to come back for, yet I had absolutely no intention of coming back. I absolutely believe that there is one God and that is the God of all of us, and I believe that God speaks to us in the way we will understand. And that's not a surprise now, is it? They were convinced that what they saw was really God. For 96.2 people to come back and say it's definitely real is a profound message. That really shows how confident they are that what they encountered was real. You see huge changes in these people's lives. People don't change their lives radically unless they have a very strong reason to change. For these near-death experiencers in my research database by the thousands, not surprisingly, they go on to make huge changes in response to what they learned during their near-death experience. Based on my personal experience, I now know, beyond a doubt, not on faith, not because somebody told me to believe this, but by my own personal experience, that God is real. I'm looking down at my body, but I'm, we're in an ambulance at this point. I'm looking down at paramedics working on me. This is when this kind of the review started happening. There was no judgment. I was the judge, jury, the prosecutor. I was the, everything about the judge of my own life. It was me judging myself on what I could have done better or could have changed. There was this blueprint of my life and there was challenges put in place for me to overcome. And, and it was obvious that I didn't pass any. It was obvious that nothing I did actually accomplished anything. And all of these challenges were still there. They were, you know, unfinished. Like if life was the game, 
I, I very, I'm very much failed. We're not forcing you to go back, but we highly recommend you go back because I just saw how badly I screwed everything up and um, I'm gonna, I wanna go fix it. After that, there was this amazing kind of holographic image that completely surrounded me in this room and it was my future. And it was like basically the future of Earth. It was very different. It, it was changed so much that it didn't make sense. Say I was about 50 years old and you can tell that things were not what they are now. Something big changes the earth. If you look at the book by Rabbi Yehuda Ftaya, who got his information from different sources, from the Zohar, from his Rabbanim, but also got it from Dibukim. Dibukim is people that were taken over by other Neshamot. Regular people like you and I, where a Neshama went inside their body and took control. Why is this Neshama here even? This Neshama is not in Gainom, didn't have the merit to go to Gainom. It went to a place beforehand called Kafa Kela. Now, Kafa Kela does not have a 12 month sentence. Kafa Kela could be for a thousand years, could be forever, could be for five minutes. There's no time frame on it. Kafa Kela is non stop punishment. When someone is in Kafa Kela, they give them all different types of punishment. They have certain malachim that are in charge of beating him or her non stop. But they give him the hope that he can run away. So he's constantly running away from them. Now, sometimes they take his neshama and they fling it like a slingshot into outer space, from one corner of the galaxy to the other, back and forth. But throughout that whole journey, they're beating him. So when that poor man that dies is in the grave, this is what he has to look forward to if he's a sinner. So the first thing a person needs to know is realize that he's not going to be here forever. Everyone thinks they're going to live 120 years. The reality is the longer you live, the more you realize it's not going to happen. Now the first thing that happens after a person dies is these Malachi Kabbalah come and they don't know what mercy is. There's no concept of mercy. This is one of the things that we fail to understand. We think mercy like we think of mercy. We think there's mercy in Shemaim like here. To give you a little bit of a understanding, it's just like Hashem is unlimited in the amount he loves you. He's also unlimited in the amount of wrath that he has. There's no concept of limit. The punishment that you can think of in your mind is not even remotely the same of what's actually out there because you think of in limited capacity. 
So some of the things you're going to hear is like, oh, come on, what kind of uh, God is this? It sounds vicious. It sounds horrible. Yes, it is. That's the point. It is horrible. It is vicious. So the first thing they do these Shem Elachem is they actually, there's one specific Malach that comes to the body. And the first thing actually they do is they make the grave deeper. So it's only like I told you, it's one and a quarter meters according to Allah, but they make the grave deeper. Why deeper? Because at that moment, they take the neshama and they put it back in the goof. They put it back into the body. And then they have the body stand up. Why? They want it to stand up and feel it full. Why feel it full? Because both the body and the soul sinned. What happens the moment you die? The Zohar Kadosh, Parashat Naso, page 127a. And also Parashat Vayekil. Page 99, say that there are seven levels of judgment at death. First is the type of death. How did you die? The Gemara in Maseret Brachot, page 8a, says that there are 903 different types of deaths in this world. The second is the journey that takes place before death, from the time a person dies until they get buried. What happens during that time? Third, whether people are going to show up to your funeral, someone's going to say Kaddish, if the person that's going to say Kaddish is actually a kosher person or not, because if it's not a kosher person, it's better off he doesn't say Kaddish. If it's not a person that keeps Shabbat, it's better off he doesn't say Kaddish. Why? Because you can't even say Amen to his Kaddish, even if he's your son or he's your father or he's anybody. If he doesn't keep Shabbat, his Kaddish is worth nothing. According to the Torah, someone's a Mechalel Shabbat is considered an idol worshiper. So what, you want somebody that's an idol worshiper that worships a different God to go pray for you? After you die, who wants that? That's a problem for you. But if you have a righteous person, say Kaddish on you, you have a good Rav, come to the funeral, give everybody Chizuk. As Shlomo HaMelech says, it's better to go visit someone at the time of death and mourning than to go to his party, go to his wedding. Why? Party, people make Averot, people make sins. No one does tshuva at parties, really. But at funerals, a few people are going to do tshuva. It's better to go to that. The third level of judgment is how you're deposited into the grave. It's the gate being deposited into the grave is they, in essence, take the body after they wrap it. Shem yirachem, shem yirachem. They put it into the grave. And that's, in essence, the gate that is leaving this world and entering the next world. The fourth is what happens to the person once they're actually in the grave. What kind of beating are they going to get? What kind of suffering are they going to have in the grave? Now naturally we're going to say, wait a minute, what's suffering? What are you talking about? The guy's dead. The Gemara says, even though to everybody else, the body is not moving, the heart is not pumping, the brain is not functioning, the eyes don't see, the ears don't hear, when you inflict pain on it, it feels it even more than it does in this world. The fifth, is what's going to happen with the maggots and the worms. The maggots eat the inner body. It's the worms that eat the outer body. This is not a pleasant experience. The sixth and seventh, whether they go to heaven or to Gainom. In Gainom there are seven chambers. In heaven there's also seven chambers. And then there's the Galut of the Neshama, which is the seventh level of judgment. Parashat Nasoi Nazar says, after everybody leaves, all of the other dead, they start yelling and screaming. If you're a tzaddik or a tzaddika, they celebrate. Oh, why if they're rasha? So in Gemara, there's a debate between Antoninus and Rebbe. Antoninus says to Rebbe, Neshama in the goof, the Neshama in the body can get away with sinning. Why? They go up to, they go up to Shemaim, to the Betin of Shemaim. The Neshama says, listen, I didn't sin. It was the body that sinned. The body sinned. I didn't sin. Well, I could do something without the body. Look, when I was over here, I was holy. I was doing everything good. I, you put me into the body, I started sinning. I didn't do it. It was the body that sinned. The body says to Shaman, look, I can't move. Look, as soon as you took the neshama out of me, I was free. I couldn't move. I'm a golem. Nothing. A piece of meat. Steak. Nothing. The neshama goes to Shamaim. He says, Hashem, I can't sin without the goof. I can't sin without the body. The body says, Hashem, I can't even move without the soul. Hashem says, put them back together and judge them as an individual. No free lunch. All those people that tried to kill themselves thinking that they, after they kill themselves, 
their troubles will be over. If they actually know what's going to happen a minute they die, they'll regret the moment they thought about ending their life. Because life actually just begins at that moment. Gemara Masechet Sanigrin, page 91b. Now the first thing that happens after a person dies is these Malachi Chabalah come. They make the grave deeper because at that moment they take the Neshama and they put it back into the body. And then they have the body stand up because both the body and the soul sinned. And then one of these vicious Malachi Chabalah comes and he says, what caused this person to sin? Oh, it all starts with the eyes. He looks at his friend's garden. He looks at his friend's bank account. He looks at his friend's wife. What led them to, to sin? The eyes. So one first angel comes, he's responsible for what? Taking him out of his eyes. Over and over again to make sure this is why you sin. You followed your eyes, now you understand how much trouble it's going to get you in. Now you guys think, oh, okay, so eyes, not good. Da, da, da. No, no, you don't understand. Everything in the Olam met is at least 60 times stronger. What's the source for this Kafa Kela? In the book of Samuel 1, chapter 25, verse 29, it already talks about Kafa Kela. And the soul of your enemies will hurl the Kafa Kela. Now this Kafa Kela, how long is the sentence? It could be four hours, it could be 4,000 years. One of the Dibukim that Abu Daftaya writes about in Minchat Yehuda is that he actually dealt with the Dibuk of the soul, Shabtai Tzvi, Machshimo Vizikho. One of the false messiahs of a few hundred years ago. They burn him, they put him into ashes, they build him back up. They torture. This is before Gehenna. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dusty earth will awaken for everlasting abhorrence. And from here we learn that the dead people feel pain. The dead body feels the pain of the worm that's eating his body. Yeah, but you're looking at him, he doesn't have a pulse feels it nonetheless. You can't see it because your eyes are limited because of your brain. It feels it 100% even more so. Now how long is this genome? You go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 24. It says the following, The men that rebelled against me, for their worms won't die, and their fire, meaning genome, will never be extinguished. Well, how long is the sentence genome? To us is forever. So anyone that tells you otherwise, Give me a verse that contradicts what we're saying. We will change the Torah together. So Eliyahu and Avi wrote a book called Tana Devei Eliyahu, the teachings of Eliyahu and Avi. So there's one place where it says, seven things existed before creation. What were they? The Torah, Tshuva, Genom, Gan Eden, the throne of glory, the name of the Mashiach, and Bet HaMikdash. Torah was created, as we talked about in Masechet Chagiga, 974 generations before Hashem created the world. He took black fire and he wrote on white fire and he wrote the Torah. When was Gehenom made? On the second day of creation, Hashem Barach did not say Tov. He didn't say good. Second day, no good. So why no good on the second day? Because that's when he created Gehenom. Wasn't happy about creating Gehenom, but nonetheless, it's a very necessary part. Why was the third day Tov Me'od? Because that's when he created Satan. Because those are the things that are going to keep people in check. He didn't create us because he wants to punish us, but he created us nonetheless to follow his law. And if we don't, there's a price to pay. So now, Tana de Be'eliyahu says, How do we know Geno predated creation? Sefer Yeshaya, chapter 30, verse 33. Tifteh had been prepared yesterday. Tifteh is another name for Geno. He, meaning Hashem, has deepened and widened it. So many Rashaim in every generation, he has to make it bigger. Its inferno has much fire and wood, and the breath of Hashem is like a steam of sulfur burning within it. Every single human being on earth has a kaparat abonot, has a mamash, a suffering, smelling the smell of sulfur. Every person, you, me, everybody. And the Shema knows a secret. That's the chemical they use in Shemaim and Geno. Same smell. In Geno is sulfur. No, 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 take me there. Finish his tshuva. When the Holy One blessed his sea, created Gehenom, he praised all of his works. Even Gehenom is worthy of God's praise. Without it, the world would cease to exist. So now you have yourself another source, Tana Deve Eliyahu. You have a problem, call Eliyahu and Avi. Maybe I'll help you out. Some people made a video about how it's not true, how Gehenom is a figment of our imagination. This is it. 
Gehinom. It's not a place of burning and torment that's all described and mentioned in the New Testament and by uh, Jewish mysticism and on and on, okay? And show you that it's not really such a bad place. The pagan worshippers would build their altars over here and they would actually sacrifice their children to Moloch in this area of Gehinom. God came down to tell us what he needs, not what we need. The reason we go to hell when we die is because we want to be with our friends. If you go to heaven, who are you going to talk to? There is really a serious, proper definition or description of hell. The burning in hell is the embarrassment that a soul feels when it doesn't know how to be a soul anymore. How long does it take to readjust? Maximum 12 months. After 12 months, you're in heaven. Are we here to get from God what we need? No. God is the needy one not us. God needs us more than we need him. So if everybody suddenly became religious, would that, be, would that mean Mashiach is coming? No, that would mean we're really in trouble. Because <laughs> when people become religious, it's not good for anybody. Now what's the source of the word Gehinom? The source of the word Gehinom is the valley of Ben Hinom. Gay Ben Hinom which was a person that lived in the times of Kings. Kings 2, chapter 23, verse 10, and it's also mentioned in a few other places. They brought human sacrifices to a statue called Molech, and they took little Jewish babies in Israel, Jews, and they sacrificed them to a statue. So that's why they called this place Gehenom. And they said that this, this, what they're doing over here, burning Jews and so on, to statues and so on, is Gehenom, in essence, is a symbolic of bad. What's the worst thing that we can think of? Genom, hell! Genom is not the only name. If you look at the Zohar Kadosh in the uh, Rashid Chochma, you're going to find out a few interesting things. So in the Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, 31 bit, it says that Hashem created the world for the sake of Yirat Shamayim, for the sake of you fearing Him. And someone does the opposite, it's better that He wasn't created. Why? Because now Hashem has to punish Him. Hashem doesn't want, didn't create you because He wants to punish you. Created you because he wants to reward you. He wants to give you a reward. He wants you to do mitzvot. But nonetheless, that does not mean that there's a free ride. Like everybody thinks. There's no free ride just because Hashem loves you. Just because you love your kids. It doesn't mean they can do whatever they want. Any normal person understands that. But unlike parent of flesh and blood that's limited with their feelings, Hashem is not limited. So now, if we look at the books, the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah the prophet, chapter 9, verse 6. They say, it's better that everything in the world cease to exist if there's no Yirat Shemayim. It doesn't mention love Hashem. Knowing who you're dealing with, already we start with Yirat Shemayim. It says it's better that it was all canceled. All creation was canceled and there will be no Yirat Shemayim in the world. Sefer Shmot, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 2, says, I am your God. This is officially the first mitzvah that Hashem Itbar gave to Am Yisrael to know, fear me. There's another reason that Rashid Chochmah says, it's called Gehenom because the screams and growls from Gehenom reach from one corner of the world until the end. The screams of what's happening over there, very much alive and real. We're not talking about a shame. No one says, oh, you embarrassed me. No one said that yet. The screams of pain and agony reach from where it is until the end of the galaxy, until the end of the universe. Why is it called Tafteh? Because the root of the word Tafteh is Pitui. Pitui means to entice. All of the ones that go to Gehenom was because of the enticement of the Yetzirah. Yetzirah came and he said, do this, this, and this. They followed Hashem Yerachem, Hashem Yerachem. Only bad things happened. And it says here in Perek Kishon of Maseret Gehenom. It says there are three gates to Gehenom. One is in the ocean. One is in the desert, where they put Korach. One is Be'ishuv, which is Yerushalayim. Where do we know it's in the ocean? The book of Yonah, chapter 2, verse 3. One of the names of Gehenom is Sheol. He took me out of there, Hashem. That's one of the sources. When do we know it's in the desert? Sefer Bamidbar, Numbers, chapter 39, verse 33. And they all were thrown into there, into Sheola. What's Sheola? Sheol means Gehenom. Who are we talking about? Korach ve'adotor. The ground opened up, swallowed them up, and they're still there today. Where do we know that it's in Yerushalayim? Book of Isaiah, chapter 31, verse 9. The oven in Yerushalayim. What's your oven in Yerushalayim? Gate of Gehenom. Have you heard so far anything about Busha? Anything about embarrassment yet? I'm still looking. Eliyahu Navi says, some say it's in Shemaim. What do you mean, some say? Chachamim explained, there's two games. 
There's one literally in this world, in this globe. Where we're in, that's below us. The other one is above the Rakia. There's two game modes. There's also two gun edits. There's one here and there's one above. It just depends who you're talking about. The one here or the one there? Nothing that I've given you so far is an opinion. Everything has to have a verse in the Torah. This is Emmet. This is from Hashem. There's also a Midrash that talks about how when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shemaim, Hashem gave him a tour. What did he give him a tour of? Hashem Itbarak decided to show Moshe Rabbeinu Gan Eden and Geinom. When Moshe Rabbeinu got to Geinom, he said, what is this place? He screamed. What is this place? He saw the screaming. He saw the fires. He saw the different types of fires. He saw the punishments. He saw all types of awful things will go over momentarily. Hashem answered Moshe, this is a place that I made to punish the Rishayim that go against me. Moshe Rabbeinu started shaking hysterically until Hashem says, don't worry, you will never see this place. If Moshe Rabbeinu thought he was a Rasha, what about us Tzadikim? We see the ones that were really Tzadikim are very worried about this place. Why? Eventually you're going to die. The dead will live again. Tiferet Yisrael, Midrash Shmuel, and several others are all saying the same thing, where this is talking about the resurrection of the dead. Eventually, we're all going to be resurrected if we're tzaddikim. If we're not, then there's a different resurrection. What's the resurrection? Eternal gain, no. eternal punishment. The living will be judged, meaning people get punished in this world as well. In order that they know, teach, and become aware of who he is. In essence, Hashem gives you all kaparat avonot in this world, whether it's finding the wrong coin that of 10 cents you found the quarter, or if you lost some money in the stock market, or you have a headache, flat tire, or any of these easy ones, or difficult ones, like Balminan, some people have cancer, divorces, this, that, lose kids, Shem Why does Hashem do all these things? There is a din and cheshbon, there is an accounting that happens in Shemaim. And this is the whole purpose of all of these things, is to you know He's God. That's the point of your life. But to say, okay, I believe in God, but go against Him on a regular basis, that means you know the wrong God. Because this God, you can't go against Him on a regular basis. Why? Because if you know who He is, you're going to realize there's a din and cheshbon that comes up after this life. The Meiri says that he is the one who created you originally and he's also the one that's the Yotzer, that means that he's constantly sustaining creation. He's constantly recreating the world on a regular basis. This is specifically catered to all of those people that have the excuse, oh, listen, this generation is a weak generation, so Hashem understands. So in Psalm 33, verse 15, it says, meaning Hashem knows every generation. He knows this weak generation. He knows the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu. He knows the generation of after, in between, before, after. Meaning, all of you can do Hashem. All of you can follow Hashem. All of you can do everything. There's no such thing as, no, no, we're weak, so therefore we don't have to do. He's the judge, he's the witness, he's the plaintiff. Meaning, don't think that he's going to forget anything. Don't think he doesn't know what he's doing. Don't think that you can fool him. Don't think that you can bribe him. Everything is from heaven, except the fear of heaven. Smart, not smart, not your choice. What's your choice? Fear Hashem or not. Decide whether you're going to follow what He says or not. That's your free choice. So Hashem says, I know what the outcomes of your free choices are. Actually, if Hashem interfered with this free choice, He wouldn't have the right to punish us for it. This is also another misconception that most people think that everything that you did until the age of 20, you don't get punished for. That's what most people believe. This is wrong. You can find the sources in Rabbi Yudah Aftaya, you can find it in Rashid Chokhmah, you can find it in the Gemara, and a few other places that I can't remember off the top of my head. That's not what it means. What it means is that all sins that you've made until the age of 20, you don't get punished in this world. Anything above the age of 20, you can be punished for them in this world. But everything you've ever done from the time you were a baby, little toddler, you will have to pay for a reward or a punishment for regardless of what age. That's why there's also children. What we think is children. In Ganon as well. That's the way the world was created. Hashem created. You have a complaint, go to Him. There's a complaint box. It looks like a garbage bag. That after we realize there's no such thing as favoritism in Shemaim, after we realize it doesn't matter who your father is, the Sukh in the Torah said, Et Esav Saneti. Hashem says, I hated Esav. Barab Asechet Sanedrin says, Esav has no Allah Mava. Why is it Rasha? His father's Lodo. His grandfather was even bigger. His brother was Tadiq. So there's no favoritism in Shemaim. Doesn't matter who your father is. Doesn't matter who your friends are. Doesn't matter who your uncle is. Doesn't make a difference. Whatever you are, wherever you are, Hashem knows. Ani Mevin. He knows. 
ולא מכך שוחד, there's no bribery, meaning that a person cannot think that no, 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 but I made some mitzvot, so that's fine. Those mitzvot are going to replace my sins. I wasted sin for 20 years of my life. I did tshuva, and I keep Shabbat now. And I don't waste sin anymore, and I keep Shabbat. That fixes it, right? No. Good, you're going to get schal for keeping Shabbat, doing tshuva, and not wasting sin anymore. But to fix the wasting seed has a different tikkun. But to say just because you stopped it, therefore it goes away, or just because you made a different mitzvah, therefore everything else before that happens, this is exactly what it says. You cannot use your current mitzvot as bribery to Hashem. But mitzvot, you're going to get schal for. Sins, you'll get punished for. You still have to do tshuva every single day. The other thing is someone's religious. Okay, so you keep some mitzvot, chazak u but you're still making sins. The good news is that Hashem pays well. He even pays the rashaim. So how much is he going to pay the kids that he loves so much? It's not all hopeless. It's not all terrible. Not just punishment. It's also good. But it's midah kineged midah time. Even your ability to do mitzvot is his. Everything is going to be accounted for. Even extra words you spend talking to your own wife. Imagine if it's not your wife. The Knesset Israel says that the, the reckoning, the cheshbon, is also referring to the fact of how bad the sin was. It didn't say that. It says how much kavanah you had in your sin. How excited were you to make a sin? How excited you are to go do something against the Shem? Says that, my friends, you pay extra for. And don't let the Yetzirah let you think that just because you didn't really ask to be born, therefore you can sin. Because the reality is that even though if the Mishnah says you were born even without asking, you will die without asking, you will live without asking. At the end of the day, every single person in the hospice center, you told them, listen, you're dying. What do they try to do? They still try to get another breath. They still try to breathe more. They still want more. They're still willing to pay every single penny to live another second, another moment. The fact that you didn't ask to come is irrelevant. Once you're here, you want to be here. Everyone tries to take an extra breath, even if they know that living another moment will be pure suffering. I can tell you from my own personal experience, but despite the fact that I told you guys that after the first surgery, I was begging the doctors to kill me, and if there was a plug, I would have pulled it myself, the reality is I still continue to breathe. Now, even though the next 62 days were massive pain, my own version of Gainom in this world, Obviously, after I read about Gainom, it's no one near. But nonetheless, it was my own version of Gainom. I still continue to breathe. Why? You still want to live. But nonetheless, I continue. Why did I continue? It's suffering. It's painful. Why? Because everyone wants to live. Even the guy that commits suicide. The second he jumps off, he realizes the mistake. How do I know? People that tried to commit suicide said it. One guy that actually jumped off of the bridge in uh, the Golden Gate in San Francisco. He actually survived. Jumped maybe five, six years ago. He's one of two people that ever survived jumping off the Golden Gate. He said himself, there's a video online of him. Young guy, maybe your age. He says, my life was horrible. My life was miserable. I hated it. I got on the next bus, I sat in the very last seat in the middle row, we began to drive out to the Golden Gate Bridge. A wave of emotion overcame me as I stepped down off of this bus. My feet heavy, my heart palpitating, waterfalls flowing out of my eyes. I walked forward. As I stood atop the Golden Gate Bridge walkway, staring and leaning over the four-foot-nothing rail, peering down to the looming waters below. I walked back toward the traffic. I ran as fast as I could, and I threw myself over the rail. The millisecond that my hands left that rail, instant regret for my actions. I fell 220 feet, 25 stories at 75 miles an hour in four seconds. I prayed on the way. What have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. The second my feet left the bridge, I regret. Everything flashed in front of my eyes and I realized it was a mistake. Why everyone wants to live? The fact that you want to live, that's the reason why you have to pay the bill for the full fence. Any sin you make, you will have to pay. Ultimately, this whole thing, this whole point of your life is to know that at the end, you will have to pay the bill. In Psalm 139, verse 7 and 8, King David says to Hashem, where can I go? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I make my depths to the lowest depths, you're there too. Can't run away from Hashem. Genome is very much a subject that people need to know about because that is the one way that if a person understands it, even if it's once in their life, 
They learn about it, they understand it, they can meditate on it, they can think about it at one point or another, especially before a big sin, especially before they make the mistake of their life, especially before they go in a wrong direction. If they understand this and believe it, this is the type of information that can keep you away from the Yetzirah. Now in regards to the timing of how long a punishment is, Kafa Kela, which comes before Gehenom, has no limitations, and neither does Gehenom. Different punishments have different timings. In the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 106a, they say that Doeg and Achitofel both knew an enormous amount of Torah. How much Torah? They were G'dolei Adol, giants. They're still in Gehenom, and they're not leaving. It's been a few thousand years now. Where do we get it from? Psalm 55, verse 24. And you, our Lord, you shall cast them down into the well of destruction. Men of bloodshed and deceit, which is referring to Doeg and Achitofel, they shall not live out half their days the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 103a and b. Yerovam ben Navat. How much Torah did he know? This is someone that used to be righteous. Everyone thinks he was wicked from birth. He wasn't. Anything you want will give you 103 different understandings. So now, Yerovam ben Navat, where is he? Genom. How long is Genom? Eternal. No breaks. No 12 months. No busha. No, no, no embarrassment. As far as timing is concerned, there's no 12 months such thing. There's no specific timing. In Gemara Masechet Brachot, page 18b, Shabbat, page 13b, and Shabbat, page 152a, it says the pain of the worms eating the corpse, the body that's in the grave that everyone thinks doesn't feel anymore. He feels the same pain as a person that's alive and well, multiplied by 60 because the concept of pain and Shamaim is very different. Here you feel a small part of the soul, mostly body. There, it's multiples of the soul. Where's the other source in it? Torah itself, not just Gemara. Book of Job, chapter 14, verse 22. He feels the pain of his flesh and his soul mourns over him. The one that suffers most that we know of in the Torah, he's giving us the source of the fact that even after someone dies, the pain of the flesh, the soul is mourning over it. Why? Because the soul is feeling it. There's different levels of pain depending on how wicked we were or if we did tshuva or not. If we do tshuva, none of this applies to you. If we do real tshuva, you stop messing around, you do tshuva, you keep mitzvot, you follow what Hashem says, everything is good. You have nothing to worry about. If you don't, you have everything to worry about. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 29, it says, But jealousy brings rotting of the bones. It says, Anyone who is jealous in his heart, except if you're jealous of Torah, which is a good jealousy, Every other jealousy, he says, not only does the body actually feel pain, but also the bones too. Why? They rot. And the soul feels that too. So it doesn't pay to be jealous. Book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 39. The prophet Jeremiah says, what is a person, a living person complaining about? Everything that's happening to him is his own sins. You complain that your, the bones are going to rot. You did it. You complain again. Oh, you did it. Anything you complain. You did everything. Don't complain. Or do tshuva. That's in essence the beginning. The beginning of tshuva is understanding that every single thing you're going to do is you. Olam ba good, olam ba bad is you. That's first thing that you understand. So now, instead of complaining, he says the next verse, let us search and examine our ways and return. Meaning, let's do tshuva to Hashem. Now, sometimes people don't understand the simple measures that I gave you so far. If you violate Shabbat, according to the Torah, in 12 places in the five books of Moses. According to the Shulchan Aruch, seven places. According to the Zohar, according to every single book that was ever written by any major Chacham before this generation that wrote about Shabbat, every single one of them. If you violate Shabbat, you don't have a small punishment. You have the same punishment as Yehovah. You have the same punishment as the worst sinners that ever existed. Want to drive to Beknezet on Shabbat? You have a serious problem. It's not a temporary problem. It's not a sometimes problem. It's an eternal problem, which will go over momentarily. You're not allowed to even benefit from Abu Dazara. Meaning, if you have a little statue, to somebody worship it. Somebody says, listen, you bought it for $25, I'll pay you $25 million. What are you allowed to do with Abu Dazara? Destroy it. It's the only thing you're allowed to do with it. But unfortunately, in today's generation, the religious world, unfortunately, sometimes puts it on their head. Why? Because every single one of these wigs that's coming from in the market, that's called kosher, we verified. We have people in India. They checked. They're Indian. They went to the temples themselves. There's no such thing as kosher wigs. It doesn't exist. Which means all wigs, according to statistics, are coming from Abu Dazara. You have a wig on your head, you have a problem. One rabbi says, no, don't bring him to our synagogue. Why can't I bring him to our shul? Why not, Kodalav? Oh no, he said something bad about wigs. But is it made up? Did he make it up? Is it his opinion? Doesn't make a difference. My wife wears a wig.
This market is gigantic, beyond comprehension. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars of turnover yearly in this extension field. Jayanti is honoring a promise to the God she believes healed her. She hasn't anything more valuable to offer than her hair. This is called tonsuring, and every year millions of Hindu pilgrims shave their heads out of humility and in gratitude to the gods. Each temple has a contract to sell hair to a particular company or auctions it to the highest bidder. On average, say in a month, we're getting about in excess of five tons. The demand for really good quality and super quality, fine quality hair is always there and it's always growing. They've all gone absolutely nuts. The orders are coming in, yeah, three times faster than we can possibly ship them out. Hair is almost as valuable. If you will look at it as, as, uh, as a commodity, it should be quoted and is up there with gold and silver and platinum without a doubt, because obviously the demand is far greater than supply. We have discovered an amazing pent up demand not just for people who want to look good or copy the celebrities who go from short hair to long hair in a day. Basically for a huge market out there of your average everyday woman housewife who just needs more hair or just a new expression just to feel good about themselves. The women who give their hair up at the temple as a form of sacrifice would, if it were a money question, actually give that hair to the people going around the villages. Women, when they come into our shop, I see the eyes gleaming with happiness and they see so much hair. Their joys, you, you can't see how joyful they are because they think their beauty is enhanced by this wearing this hair phenomenally. The Torah forbids benefiting from idolatry in any way. Can't wear it, can't make it, can't sell it, can't have any part of it. This is for all Jews, regardless of culture or community. The big rabbis that permitted wigs in past generations did not and cannot ever permit them if they are coming from idolatry temples. The permission was done in past generations before idolatrous temples joined world commerce and took over 98% of the world wide wigs market. Bottom line, if you're wearing a real hair wig, you have a very serious problem with God until you destroy it. The kosher certification on wigs is the biggest scam of the generation. Sometimes you tell them the truth, it's not enough. Psalm 94, first verse. El nakamot Hashem, el nakamot ofia. David Melech writes, the God of vengeance, the God of vengeance appeared. Anyone that thinks that Hashem only loves and doesn't punish, there's a verse in the Torah that says exactly the opposite. But this is just one of many. We've mentioned several so far. The Gemara Maseret Baba Kama, page 50a, says, Rabbi Chanina says, Kol ha'omer HaKadosh Baruch Hu v'atran yivatru me'av. Anyone that says that Hashem lets go of things, gets an extra special punishment where they actually cut them like a steak pieces and they know. It's hard to say, it's hard to do, but nonetheless, it's true. The book of Shit Chokhmah, following it said, Genom has five different fires. The concept of fire here is nothing. One fire that eats and drinks. Shotave now chelet drinks but doesn't eat. One fire is 60 times worse than this world. Then there's a fire that's able to get in the way of that fire. Literally, a fire that could make another fire go out. But the highest level of fire, ish, ochelet ish. Fire that there's no other fire in the world that can even, you can remotely imagine. There are certain coals in Geinom that are the size of mountains. There are certain coals that are the size of hills. There are certain coals that are literally like you know, the Dead Sea. There are rivers of tar and sulfur. These rivers of sulfur and tar, are in essence lava, are pulling these special coals called retamin. What's retamin? The Gemara Masechet Chagiga 
says the Tanim is a certain type of coal that cannot go out. Doesn't matter, you can put water on it from here until next year. It continues. Says, what's the judgment of a Rasha, of a wicked person that died without doing tshuva? What happened to him? These Malachi Chabala, these certain types of angels that don't know mercy. So what do they do? They take all the Rashaim as they enter and they push them into the worst part you can possibly imagine, time 60. And then there is ones that are waiting for them in the fire, waiting for them in the pit to do the rest of the job. And they use the verse from Isaiah 5.14 that uh, Gainom opens its mouth. It continues to expand as more and more people come. Mahama Sachet Megillah asks, how big is Gainom? How big is Gan Eden? Gan Eden is 60 times the size of earth. How big is Gainom? No size. Why? It continues expanding. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, one time I was walking and I saw Eliyahu Navi. And the Navi came from Olam Ha'emet, came from the real world. And he says, would you want to see what Gehenom looks like? Yes, I want to see. And now he tells us what he saw. He showed me people that are hanging by their nose. A woman walks around with extra perfume and you're enjoying it. He showed me people that are hung by their arms. You're stealing? Most of the time people steal with their hands. Take money that doesn't belong to you. Take a phone that doesn't belong to you. Anything that doesn't belong to you. He showed me people that are hung by their tongues. Say la shonara, you enjoyed it? Okay, that's the price. This is how this starts. So they hang them there until the punishment comes, until they come to deal with them. Different types of animals or spiritual animals and angels and so on, until they come deal with them further, they're hanging there like the butcher. Say la shonara, that's how they're gonna hang. People that are hung by their legs. He showed me women that are hung by their sex organs. You want to show this, you want to show that? Fine, no problem. They'll show you that too. What do you think? God didn't mind? No problem. They want to show their body. No problem. In Gainum, they also want to show your body. Why? There's no Yetzara there. Show me people that are hung by their eyes. All those eyes that followed things that didn't belong to them. Other people's wives, other people's husbands, other people's stuff. They looked somewhere else, doesn't belong. He showed me people where they feed them their own flesh. Certain people that were greedy. Certain people that did not want to give what Hashem provided them. Shem gave them a hundred thousand instead of giving Maaser, they gave a hundred dollars. Felt like they said Nikim. Hashem gave them some, they wanted more. Hashem made Madoff. Madoff has not just a jail here, he has jail over there also. It's just a little different. The FBI arrested him this morning after he told senior employees yesterday that his business was a giant Ponzi scheme. Tonight, as much of, as fifty billion dollars is gone vanished from Madoff clients around the world, including celebrities like Steven Spielberg, Kevin Bacon, and Elie Wiesel, and regular investors like Betty Greenfield, who lost everything. Bernie Madoff may have done more to tear down investor confidence than any individual in history. In 2009, he pleaded guilty to 11 criminal counts and received the maximum sentence, 150 years. What he did was, was awful and uh, affected the lives of so many people, um, stole people's dreams and futures and um, us among them. And uh, I'll never forgive him for that. All these greedy people that want more than one that belongs to them, this is what they do. They make say, oh, you want more? No problem. We'll feed you so much, you'll eat yourself. They take, they cut them up into little pieces. They cut their toes, one little toe at a time just to make sure, so you know, you don't eat the whole thing right away. Make sure you, you eat the whole thing one at a time. And then they start feeding him his own toes. Start feeding him his own arms. Start feeding him his own legs. And he cannot die there. He cannot die there. Like you think now, oh, well, it's the guy who loses blood after 20 minutes, he's dead. There's no death there. You're already dead. Like I said, pain times 60. Just the beginning. He showed me people, they take these gechali retamim, these calls of retamim, and they feed them. What do you say things? You said some nice things about the rabbi, you didn't like his lectures? No problem, we'll give you something to chew on. What do you say, instead of divret Torah, you want to talk about basketball in the stock market? Bitul Torah, no problem, we'll give you something to chew on while you talk about it. Go ahead, tell us. Oh, what did you do? You want to eat extra? You know, you want to have not sudash shit. you want to have nine seudot? No problem, no problem. We'll give you something else to eat. He showed me people that are sitting there and the maggots and worms are eating them. Their faces are blank in other places. It talks about in the Zohar and other places. And the maggots are coming in and out of their body. They can't move, they can't do anything about it. But they feel it and they're screaming and they're yelling because their flesh is being eaten by the second. Their worms will never die. And he showed me people where they feed them sand. 
very thin sand against their own will. And the Malachi Asharet, it says Kadosh Ba'uchu, but it really it's referring to Malachi Asharet, the angels of God, are pushing this, this sand, glass in essence, sand, glass, into their mouth, breaking their teeth, blood everywhere. Same as Hashem Rechem, you would see it in a scary movie here. And they're stuffing their mouth beyond their control and then yelling at them. When you ate things that didn't belong to you, you had enjoyed it. Why don't you enjoy this? It's free. Why are you complaining? You're enjoying something that wasn't you. What were you enjoying? You ate something? You didn't say bracha? You ate an apple? You forgot to thank God? To eat, you didn't forget. But the blessed Hashem they gave you, you forgot. Where's the Pasuk? Psalm 3, verse 8. The teeth of the wicked you broke. And he showed me people where they take them from a place of fire to a place of snow, like moving cattle. Took them from the fire and they took them to the freezing cold. There's two two, two types, two parts of Gano. Even Kafakela, we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Kafakela has itself several different sections, just a bedin there, just a bedin is three floors, and each floor has 6,000 rooms, and each room has 6,000 windows, and each window has a certain section of people, and three judges in each window, and after you finish the judgment on the first floor and you go get punished for it, you have to come back. Why? Second floor. And after you get punished for the second floor, however many years it is, could be five, could be 10, could be 5,000. You have to come back. Why? There's the third floor to deal with. You haven't gone to Gehenom yet. Do you understand why it's not worth sinning Rabotai? Rabbi Yochanan says every single angel is designated for a person for one of their sins. All these angels are your creations. Every single time, the Gemara says, every single time a person makes a sin, he creates an angel. What's the angel? Angel is not only the witness that goes to Shamaim. Yeah, yeah. I'm the one when he ate pig on Tuesday, January 12th. I'm the one. Or I'm the one that he didn't do Birkat Amazon. And I'm the one that did it every single time you do a sin, come back. Now a guy has a special merit. Why is a special merit? Every time you waste seed, 150 million show up. So now let's get to the sperm test. Now we talked already about the concentration of sperm. And what that means is not how much they're thinking, but it actually means how much sperm per milliliter a man makes. In a man that has a two milliliter ejaculate, which is about a half a teaspoon, that's sort of in that normal range, we will look at how many million sperm per ejaculate he makes. And a normal number should be somewhere around 20 million or higher. I've seen men that have normal sperm counts and are initiating pregnancies with counts under that. I've also seen men that come in and have 200 million sperm per milliliter that have that much difference in concentration. The, the point here and the key is that this is just a rough estimate of what a man's fertility potential is. He weighs seed, he created 150 million of them. And they're gonna come. And what happens? They're not only the witnesses. When a person's neshama leaves his body, they're also the ones that punish him. Now specifically when it comes to wasting seed, these neshamot, the, the person created, they want to rip him in half. They want to rip him into little pieces. And this is what this says of the following. And on that moment, his neshama gets thrown into Gehenom and each one of these angels that he created from his sins comes and tears him into pieces. No mercy. There's no concept of mercy in Gehenom. Gemara of Metziah, page 58b. There's several different types of people that go into Gehenom but never come out. Who are they? Someone who goes with a married woman. You want to do anything with someone who's not your wife? You have a problem. Someone who likes to embarrass other people in public. Someone who swears in the name of God they think it's a joke mentioning God's name. Someone who likes to take honor as a result of his friend's downfall. It mentions it in Proverbs, it mentions it in the Mishnah, it mentions it here, it mentions it in the Zohar, it mentions it in the Torah, it mentions it everywhere. This is literally one of the worst possible things you could do. Just because somebody arrived at Gehenom does not mean they are fixed right away. Why? Because they still have the same nature. It says in the Gemara that even at the gate of Gehenom, they don't do tshuva. The Hasid Yavitz, it says, how does it say that people don't even do tshuva at the gate of Gehenom? How's it possible? The Yavitz says, no, the Reshaim, up to the gate, they don't do tshuva. Once they go into, into Gehenom, everybody does tshuva. But unfortunately, they don't change their nature right away. If there were thieves in this world, there are thieves over there. It says here, and some of them, they, when they take them from the snow to the fire, and the fire and the snow, they take some of the snow and they put it on their armpits. Why? To hopefully it's going to cool them off when they're in the fire moments later. The angels of Hashem say to them, Reshaim, even in Gehenom, you're thieves. Based on the verse from Job 
24 verse 19. The verse is saying that even in Genom they sin. The Zohar Chadash, they give details of each Mado. Each one has a different name. The first Mado, the first part of Genom is called bowl, like a hole. What kind of hole? Similar hole, like for example, the tribe uh, threw Yosef at Sadiq into a bull, into a hole. A hole that has no water, but has scorpions and snakes. So this is a place where you have all these different types of creatures that torture the people. Now who is in control of it? Three are generals of Genom, under the leader. Who is the leader? Mitahat Yad Duma. Duma is the name of the leader. And who, what's the name of the three generals there? Their names are Mashrit, Af, Vechema. Now, where do we see this in the Torah? In the book of Deuteronomy, Parashat Ekev, chapter 9, verse 19. Moshe Rabbeinu says to Am Yisrael, I was terrified from the face of Af and Chema. Now, Af also literally means wrath, and Chema means blazing. But in reality, he says, I went up there in Shemaim, and I saw the leaders of Genom, and I was petrified of them. This is Moshe Rabbeinu. We're not scared of God, he was scared of them. And every section is full of Malachi Chabalah, it's full of these destroying angels in this particular section. We're just talking about the best case scenario. Their screaming is heard from one end of the world until the, the heavens. And what are they saying? Oi, oi! But there's no mercy. There's no concept of mercy over there. Who gets this? People that go against Tamidi Chachamim. How? What, they make websites against them? No, we're not even talking about that. Someone who just doesn't give enough respect to his rabbi. The second one, the name of it is Shachat. Here it has green fire. It says, just so you know, over here, there's no such thing as mercy. Meaning, if you, there was some type of mercy in the first one, where the screams go from one side to the end of the earth, here, nothing. There's no mercy at all. If there was anything at all in the first one, this one for sure doesn't have nothing. Now, just so you know, someone that goes to one section doesn't mean that they finish the section, they go to Ganeidim. They have to keep going up. If someone goes to the sixth, they finish the sixth, however long it is, they have to go to fifth. Someone who knows that another person's gonna make a sin, but doesn't tell them, doesn't rebuke them, doesn't tell them the truth. Hey, by the way, you know you're not allowed to drive on Shabbat. Hey, by the way, you know you're not allowed to eat there, it's not kosher. Hey, by the way, you know you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to, you know, you're not allowed to do it. No, no, let him find out on his own. He'll find, Hashem will tell him, Hashem will tell him. Okay, no problem, we have a section for you. The third chamber is called Duma. All those arrogant people, all those people that are proud of uh, whatever they are, whatever they think they are, they got a special section. If someone likes to lend other Jews and charge interest, they think they found a loophole to lend other Jews with interest. This is the biggest lie in the business world. The fact that you wrote a little piece of paper, you write on it, they're gonna burn you with the paper. Which chamber, if you ask? Third one. And the Zohar Kadosh in Parashat Tuma says that the spiritual chayot, spiritual animals that are sent to this Duma. Why, what do they do over there? They dine on the sinners. They eat the sinners piece by piece. There's nothing that they can do about it because the soul cannot die there, but they suffer tremendously. Fourth chamber, called Tita Yavin. There's a special place where people that like to make fun of poor people. Somebody poor came to you, Tzedaka, Tzedaka, go get a job. I work hard for my money. Oh, you like that? Okay, you have a place. Fourth one, just so you know, Hashem loves poor people. You have a special place, you have a special place. Who else? Someone who wastes seed, accidental. You looked at inappropriate things during the day. Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara says, you end up bringing gain home to yourself at night. You ended up wasting seeds from your dreams. You did it all accidental, why? Because it's not accidental. You looked where your eyes don't belong. You looked at every woman that walks. You wasted seed at night. Now you have a special place. Who else? Some people have this thought that Jews are allowed to go with non-Jews as long as they're not married. That rabbi, they made him a special section for himself. Now, Zohar Kadosh says, there's a special angel named Olei that is, has a special mission in this Mado. What does he do? All those people that get upset, they get angry and they lose their mind and they start cursing even themselves. Because Vamash, they lost their cool, they lost their speech, they lost everything. Says, oh, he has a special mission to deal with them. Where? In this specific Mado. There's a special snake called Karaton. Karaton is the one that was also created in creation, similar to Leviathan. Leviathan, which we're gonna eat when the Mashiach comes, this is the bad version. Karaton is the one that eats people 
or eats their flesh and their skin and all types of horrible, awful things in this special Mado. Mado Chamishi Nikra Sheol. The fifth one is called Sheol. All of those people that are apikos, people that go against the Torah, people that are even heretics against one simple thing. In a special place, where? Fifth level. Where else? Zohar Kadosh says, all of those homosexuals, all of those that are tebrit, this is their place. Because a special punishment that happens in this one is they burn them into little ashes and then put them back together again and again and again until no end. Sixth one, Tzalmavit. This is a people that had incest or went with a nida. Oh, you couldn't wait until your wife went to the mikveh? You thought it was a good idea? No problem. But also you have to understand as well says that even kissing a woman that doesn't belong to you, women that dress immodestly, they always ask, what about immodesty? You haven't mentioned it yet. Yep, then the worst one. You made a picture, you put it on the internet because you look cute in a bathing suit. You have a problem. They continue to make sins. Not even a headshot you should have. You're the sixth level. You'll get a lot of attention there. Tons of attention. The Mekubal Arab Shani. He said, this is where the wigs go. Ben Ishchai. He took his soul out of his body. And he saw what happens in Geinom. And he met two people. Both of them were decreed to go to the sixth level of Geinom. One of them was a thief. The other one was a womanizer. So both of them got the same Geinom, sixth level. And the Ben Ishchai says, they would tell him how much time is left. Because the one that was a robber got decreed 400 years in the sixth level of Geinom. So the second one that wrote the book, what about me? How much time do I have left? So the Malach says, we have no knowledge of how much time you have left. Why not? What do you mean you don't have any knowledge? Because you're still making sins. What do you mean? I died. I'm here. The book is still out there. People are still reading it. Seventh one, Tachtit Eretz. Someone who goes there does not go back up. Permanent. Malachi 3.21. Ubazor Parashat Truma 150 HB. It's a place in Gehenom and it's called Boiling Feces. And there, those that sinned and caused other people to sin. Onkelos, the Gen Tzedek, before he converted, he did a seance and he brought J.C. Penny up along with Bil'am and Titus. All of them are in the seventh level of Gainom. But nonetheless, that's exactly what J.C. Penny said, described as where he is. Not only did he go against the rabbis, but he caused other people to leave Judaism. Who else goes there? Souls that waste seed on purpose. They think it's healthy, like the psychiatrists that are idiots. Today they tell you it's healthy, which it not only hurts your body in general, it hurts your vision, it hurts your bone structure, it hurts your brain. It hurts multiple parts of your body. So unfortunately, it's an addiction. You can overcome it, but it's very difficult. No one's going to overcome it if no one tells them it's wrong. How wrong is it? It's the worst sin in Judaism. It's not accidental on a dream. You're doing it on purpose. Bimezi, Shem Yachem, seventh level of Geinom. Who else? Someone who violates Shabbat, drives on Shabbat, smokes cigarettes on Shabbat. If it's accidental, you forgot, you didn't know, it's one thing. But if you violate Shabbat, because it's not for you. Or you need to work because you need money because Hashem doesn't have any money. You have to work extra to help him out. Where are you supposed to be on Shabbat? With your family or Beknesset? That's it. No casinos, no vacations, no nothing. This is one of the three worst possible sins in all of Judaism to such an extent that as you can see, all of the worst things that we talked about, whether it's people that were hung by their eyes, by their nose, by their arms, by their legs, or they were eaten by worms, or they were being fed themselves, or they were being fed the sand, or they were being taking spears of, of, of metal and going through their sex organs. Or they were taking their body piece, body parts and, and throwing it in, a, in, a, in fire and you're still feeling it. All of that is child's play next to this person that's in the Chalet Shabbat. All of those things I said till now that make all of you want to vomit. It's Gan Eden next to the seventh level. Do you understand what a Mechalel Shabbat is? Do you understand why we say it in every lecture even though all everybody here about Hashem keep Shabbat? Hopefully. Now it goes into special angels of what they do and how they do it and who they punish and what they're in charge of. This is some of the angels, what they do. Those that are immodest, immodest in their clothing, immodest in their behavior. The guys that want a different girlfriend every other day. The guys that cheat on their wives. The women that cheat on their husbands. The women that are promiscuous. All of those people that think that being immodest is just a part of life. They take these people, and since there's no enjoyment whatsoever in Geinom, and there's obviously no Yetzirah in Geinom, but they force them to make the same sins even in Geinom, but with pain. 
They literally make them make the same sins against their will in Gehenom. Shem Yachem, special types of snakes and scorpions that eat the soul, not just the body. A person that curses from the same mouth that he prays, that he learns Torah, woe to him and woe to his soul. Of what they do to him for violating his mouth that way. So all of those, the ones that you asked about, the ones that have all these sex crimes, the ones that Shem Yachem violate little boys, little girls, Big boys, big girls, animals, family, friends, workers, all of them, they have a special place in the seventh level of Gehenom and they'll never come out. There's a special angel in charge of killing children and suffocating them. You read some of this stuff, you're like, Shem Yachem, this, and I understand what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying. What is this place? All types of knives and, and, and all types of cutting up and it's awful. It's just awful. I mean, I tell you, I mean, I'm not even telling you all this stuff. I'm telling you a lot, Baruch Hashem. If this doesn't wake a person up, just check your pulse. You're probably already dead. Let's take, for example, the, the, the issue of haunting and ghosts okay. as, as a kind of independent entity. Right. So the, the, the basic concept is for, for ones where you can sort of get rid of the psychological explanations. People go to a place and they experience weird things. I don't know why that one chain is swinging back there. Look at there, look, 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 look. What? Oh, what is that? What is, there's a hand. Friggin' hand, Joe. Wait, what is that? If this is paranormal thing, then we need to have this on camera. Is anybody here to let us communicate? I have just seen some. Right, that's it. I'm off down. I can't take them all. <laughs> oh hell no this is what i'm talking about dude this is what i'm talking about this is what i'm here in this building by myself bro by myself здесь кто-нибудь есть из мира духов Почему вы до сих пор находитесь в нашем мире? And sometimes they actually will see a, a character of some type. So, but yeah, I see it goes up again. Hey, wait up. Hello? That. So it's moving in the top right in front of me. Top and right by the door. What is that? Oh my god, what is that? Меня очень важный вопрос. Существует энергия, что создала Вселенную и управляет всем живым и неживым. Hello? Yeah. 
I've never done this for a reason. Long story short, we're doing a Ouija board video today. I'm freaked out. This is getting, oh, I'm shaking. What would you like from us? I don't want to do this anymore, man. This is freaky. I'm barely touching it. I don't like this. Do you mean harm? Okay, time to go. Well, where did that come from? Assuming that the reports are real. Now, many people have both Jews and non-Jews. A issue where they go to sleep, they wake up, but they can't move, and they feel like they're partially dreaming, but they're partially awake. It's called sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis, that already sounds scary. Can you imagine waking up from your sleep and not being able to move? We have two main stages of sleep, REM and non-REM. There are patients that wake up in this REM sleep paralyzed, and it is scary. In fact, there are sensations of seeing things in the room, a sensation of people sitting on their chest. That is horrendous. And finally, when you're awake, you're not even yourself, you're a zombie. These patients are eating a lot, compulsive behavior disorders, there's even some hypersexuality. There's a strong association with bipolar disorder. And in fact, it is the sleep paralysis. That's the mystery behind alien abduction. If you're awake and you can't move, it's kind of scary. You feel like you're, you're crippled, something's wrong. You just lost your ability to walk. You lost your ability to move your hands. You lost your ability to talk. I know this from experience, it's terrifying. This is millions and millions of people. As I'm lying there, I realized that there's a, an evil presence next to me. I look over, there's a dark figure. It felt as if there was a male presence there who was evil. I can remember seeing this, this figure in the doorway. I just knew it was female. It hits me so hard at times where it just knocks me off my mattress. As soon as I become aware that there's someone in the room, I'll go into a paralysis, and I can't move, I can't shout out, I can't, um, I'm unable to call for help, and I'm unable to stop any kind of attack. Usually it's an attack. You can't move, you can't scream. Um, it feels like you've been drugged somehow. Sometimes you made enough sins that Hashem sends somebody, and you feel like you have company. Sometimes you can see it, sometimes you simply can feel it. That somebody else is not from this world. If you got the merit to see it, you're gonna have one hell of a night. And sometimes that creature is not a big fan of yours. He doesn't like you too much. Why? Because many times it's very common for that, whatever you want to call it, it's maziking, starts choking you and tries to kill you. The closest I've seen of him is the arm because it's been around my throat several times. He's very violent. Um, he. He doesn't use any caution whatsoever. He, he could care less if my neck is broken. I mean, that's how violent he is. This is scientifically proven. Millions of people are dealing with this right now. It's an actual condition. If you haven't had it, you're very, very lucky. I don't know what I did, to, what made me do what I was doing. It's just, I mean, I feel like, like she said, possessed. I feel like something jumped in my body and made me just go crazy. It's not because of any other reason other than the fact that you have made some pretty big sins. And Hashem is telling you, it's time for you to do tshuva. I realized that it's some sort of satanic, uh, demonic being who's there to do me harm. I try to uh, run away, but unfortunately I can't because I Paralyzed. I can't move a single muscle in my body. You don't have to wait for Gehenom anymore. Hashem is bringing the other world into this world to make you decide. You with me or not? It's not gonna remain mystical and far away from you forever. There are more near-death experiences today than any other time in history. Documented by scientists. 
More people died and came back and told you exactly the same story. They saw a light, they saw this, they saw that. They saw some torture too. Not all of them talk about that part. More people are seeing things that are unusual in, 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 in the world. Moving things, different strange things that are not natural. The question is how many signs you're gonna need. After somebody dies, their their neshama naturally feels like it needs to be cleaned. It needs to go to Gainom to go and clean itself so it can feel better after. So the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 17a, says that there are certain people that go to Gainom for a certain amount of time, that even after the world ends, Mashiach comes, brings salvation to the world, their Gainom will not end, meaning their Gainom is eternal. So that's a misunderstanding of uh, a couple of places in the Gemara. One is in Masechet Shabbat, one is in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, where it says that once somebody dies, judgment is 12 months. Now, if that person actually read the rest of the Gemara and read the commentary on it as well, they would simply understand that it's not 12 months. So there's a few things. Number one, if a person reads the rest of the Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, he will see the judgment of 12 months is for a specific type of sinner. But then the Gemara continues and says then that there are certain types of sinners that their judgment is eternity. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, judgment for the Shaim, 12 months. See, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, wicked people, their judgment is 12 months. Misunderstanding. The Ramak says, what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is telling us is not that their judgment is literally 12 months of time, but rather they get judged at a place in heaven called Shtemesre Chodesh. It's a name of a place, not a time frame. So Shtem Yisrei Chodesh and that Gemara is an actual location. How do you prove it? By looking at the other Gemarot that say many go to Genom for much, much longer than 12 months. Not only does Genom exist, but it has very, very long sentences. This Rabotai Yikarim does not require for you to learn the secret parts of the Torah. This is literal Gemara, basic level Judaism. Someone that's wasting seed, like unfortunately many guys today, they're addicted to it, they do it sometimes daily, sometimes multiple times daily, sometimes a few times a week. Genom starts and doesn't end for you. Rabotai, it's not a joke. It's not a place you want anyone in there, including yourself or anyone you love. Wasting seed is a serious crime against the Shem. Someone that causes other people to sin. A woman that walks around immodest, she causes guys to sin. They end up wasting seed because of her. What do you think? She goes away free while he's in jail forever? She's considered machtiya rabi. You don't want to go with such a crime in Shemaim. I know it seems hard to be modest in this world because everybody else is immodest. You're wasting a big opportunity to make a mitzvah and every second you're going to need that mitzvah to protect you. If a person goes to the first six levels of Gainom for whatever sins they've committed, there is a punishment. It's a very serious punishment, but it ends at some point. It could be a month, it could be 5,000 years, it could be 5 million years, but at some point it ends. Remember, time over there is not like time over here. So yeah, here it's a year. Over there it can be 50,000 years. One of the places we learn in Torah that time is different over there, Parashat Shlach. One of the Kadosh who says to Am Yisrael, he says, you said something against the land and said Lashon Ara about the land after going there for 40 days. For every one of your days, I'm going to count a year. Punishment, 40 year punishment. No one from that generation entered Eretz Yisrael. Here we already see that a Kadosh Baruch Hu's time span, a Kadosh Baruch Hu's clock is very different than us. One second sin, centuries of punishment. So if a person goes to the first six, it ends at some point, but that's not necessarily good news. It just means it ends at some point. But if they go into the seventh place because of Machtiyah Rabim, or Motzim Zera Levatala, or Chilul Shabbat, these three major crimes, then they have a permanent problem because they'll enter Geinom Hashem Yerachem and they will not leave. And it's not going to be fun. There's a guy that has to go from point A to point B and he has two roads. One road is full of immodesty. But it's only going to take him five minutes to get to point B. The other road is has nothing on it, but it's going to take him five hours, not five minutes, to get to point B. Now, the Gemara says, if he chooses the road that's five minutes, and he closes his eyes the whole time, meaning he doesn't look at any immodesty, and he arrives at point A without being harmed at all, never touched anything, never looked at anything, nothing. In Shemaim, Rashahu, he's a wicked person. 
for having the audacity to think that he can test the Yetzirah in such a fashion and think that he can pass the test. To sacrifice your eternity for such a thing already makes a person wicked. A person needs to know that our Chachamim did not allow us to expose ourselves to sins. You're not allowed to desecrate Hashem's name or be part of a desecration of Hashem's name for the sake of a mitzvah. You look at the Gemara, Masechet Yoma, page 86. And there's a whole section about it. Sugya of tshuva. Certain things you have to do tshuva by saying I'm sorry. Certain things you have to do tshuva by waiting for Yom Kippur to say I'm sorry. Certain things you have to suffer in this world in order for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to forgive you. Certain things you have to say I'm sorry, Yom Kippur, and suffer in this world. And there are certain things nothing will help you. And one of them is Chilul Hashem. Nothing will help you with Chilul Hashem. Person that's part of Chilul Hashem. Nothing will help you. No suffering in the world will help you in this world. Why? The tshuva for Chilul Hashem only begins at death because there's not enough punishment in this world to fix Chilul Hashem. Meaning, a person goes to the Holocaust, sees his entire family die, the worst vile things in history, that does not fix Chilul Hashem. Just you understand what Chilul Hashem means. For a person to even delve into thinking that it's okay to be part of any sinful event, uh, poker in a synagogue, mixed dancing weddings, all types of things that are against the Shem, desecrating Shabbat, they have no concept of what risk they're in. Chilul Hashem, there's nothing you can do about it. No amount of punishment in this world can fix Chilul Hashem. People have no concept of what Chilul Hashem is. They have no concept. Rabbi Yisrael Misalan says, the only thing that can help you with Chilul Hashem is Kiddush Hashem. But people desecrate Hashem's name like it's nothing. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't joke around when it comes to Chilul Hashem. Never be part of any event, any organization, anything that's against Him. Nothing. If you want to do good, there's a good way to do it. You don't have to break any laws in any way, shape, or form, and you don't even have to bend them. If you truly want to do good, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you the ability to do good. The right way, the honest way, the straight way, no exceptions. Everybody was created to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The way that you have to stick to is the truth, nothing else. And I promise you it's to your benefit. I hear these things and literally my skin crawls. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give me a little bit of understanding of what punishment is and people simply don't. They waltz around this world like criminals in the open daylight without a care in the world. And you tell them, you're not allowed to go, Ribbono Shulam. You're not allowed to do this. You have to honor the Talmidei Chachamim. You just disrespected that rabbi. Ah, no, come on, he's just a person. You don't understand what you did. You can learn Torah for 30 years and disrespect that local rabbi. That local rabbi, that's a decent human being, that's Yeresh Shammai. You disrespected him, HaKadosh Baruch Hu could take 30 years of Torah and literally, zut, you don't know anything. Nothing. And in fact, kill you for it. A person doesn't understand, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not a joke. He's the Melech Malchei Amlachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I'm not trying to scare anybody here. I'm simply trying to warn you, please, please, I beg you, I beg each and every single one of you, never ever go against HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Don't try to make exceptions, don't try to do mitzvot in the way of sins. Not allowed, not allowed. If a Kadosh Baruch Hu's not there, I'm not going either. Simple. If it's yours, it's yours. If the money's yours, it's yours. If the zivug is yours, it's yours. If the kirub is yours, it's yours. Don't go break any rules. Don't jump any fences. Do what you have to do, like a straight as an arrow. A Kadosh Baruch Hu will give you as much as you want. Just open your mouth and HaKadosh Baruch Hu will fill it. He'll fill it with, with uh, Torah. He'll fill it with mitzvot. He'll fill it with chesed. He'll fill it with all the good that you want. So a person has to understand they have to help themselves. They have to help themselves. And one of the main things to help themselves in, run away from Chilul Hashem. It's scarier than Geinom. If a person understood what Chilul Hashem is, they literally will start shivering, crying, and most likely die from it. That's what Chilul Hashem is. For those that are living a, a, a life full of mistakes uh, and thinking that fear of heaven is a bad thing, being afraid of punishment is a bad thing, this is a very important answer for them to, to delve into. If a person is, let's say, about to eat something, and right before they're about to eat it, somebody comes to them and tells them, no, don't eat. Why? What do you want? You want some? No, 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 it's poison in there. All of a sudden, they hear poison. Oh, they jump back. Whoa, it's scary. You crazy? What's going on? Yeah, it's poison. Were you scaring me? Why are you scaring me? I'm not scared. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. Now, a normal person 
that gets this warning does not become unhappy, but rather the opposite. They're elated, they're ecstatic, that their life was saved before it was too late. The objective of fear of the Almighty is not necessarily to scare you for the sake of scaring you. It's not a scary movie in order to get the adrenaline running. To learn about Gehenna and Kafakela and Chibuta Kever and all of these horrible, horrific places, it's not there in order to make you think if you're observing mitzvot and you see somebody else not observing mitzvot, you could just think of them as, oh, these people are gonna get burned in hell and they're gonna die. To be scared constantly in a sense that uh, if you make one wrong mistake, Hashem is gonna cut you into 50 million pieces. The objective is to warn somebody in order to bring them happiness. That you're elated, you're excited that, oh, I got another chance, I didn't even realize I was in such jeopardy. That's in essence the message that a person is supposed to get out of fear of the Almighty. Sadly, many people have made enough sins and become addicted to certain sins to the point where to simply tell them this is not good because you will get punished is not enough to motivate them to realize that they are being warned because they're so addicted to a certain sin that they have created a spiritual shell called a klipa that's on top of their soul that makes them much less conscious and, and much less sensitive to the truth. The only thing that can break the shell is something hard. The words of the Gaumi Vilna is, and they get at the guy, sometimes a person makes enough sins, their soul has a shell on it, has a klipa that is like a stone. And the only way to get to the heart of that stone is by breaking it. Speaking to them softly is not gonna work. You have to break that shell. So sometimes a person has enough sins in their life that simply telling them a Mechalel Shabbat is death penalty. Look, it says in Parashat Kitisa. Look, it says in the Shulchan Aruch, death penalty. Sometimes a person will say, oh, wow, death penalty, I'm not going to do it anymore. Unfortunately, not common. Most people, they say, oh, death penalty, yeah, but I see a lot of my friends driving on Shabbat, no one's dying. So then you have to go a little further. You tell them, listen, Mechalel Shabbat, death penalty, and has no Olam Abba. Mechalel Shabbat, is considered an idol worshiper, meaning your Judaism is on suspension. You're considered the same thing as Buddha. Literally putting yourself in a, in a situation where you cannot be counted in a minyan. If you are a witness in a wedding, the wedding is not valid. It's Oh, is that just an opinion? No, no, no. It's Alcha Moshe Misinai. There's no other opinion. You cannot be part of such things. Friend, brother, sister, doesn't make a difference. It's a Chilul Hashem. It's a desecration of Hashem's name. And the rabbi that allowed it to happen, he's also an idol worshiper. Be surprised if he keeps Shabbat. It's not an opinion. It's too much. Some people, it's not enough. So what do you do when these people are addicted to pornography, when they're addicted to Hollywood, when they're addicted to material, when they think that the Torah is only your opinion and not, not from Moshe Rabbeinu, not from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not from the sages. They think that it's a subjective. That means that they have a klipa. They have a klipa on their soul and they don't even realize it exists. And that klipa is not like an eggshell. It's more like cement wall. Only way to break it is with a hammer. You have to get a sludge hammer and trach. Why? Because he made enough sins, he doesn't even realize what he can't see. So you have to bring him something that is gonna shock his life. You have to show him what it looks like to be in the grave when those Malachi Chabala come and rip him apart to 50 million pieces until he tells them their name and how the angels are going to fling him from one soul to the other to the other place. End of Masechet Shabbat talks about how these angels practically play soccer with his neshama. And then Rabbi Yudaftaya says that his body transforms. He starts looking like an animal. He has hair coming out of his face. And then in the middle of a conversation that he's trying to have with Rabbi Yudaftaya, two different angels come and rip his testicles off. And all types of horrible things that your mind cannot even fathom. And why? Because this is what is required to break his klipa. And it's all real, and it's all not even 1% of what actually transpires over there. What can we do that we live in a generation where the majority of people require that type of teachings in order to realize that they're simply being warned to not go against the Shem. It's not to scare you for the sake of creating some adrenaline rush, I promise you. If you read the words of the Ben Ishchai, when he talks to Jewish ladies in his books, and he says, Tzadikah, Bat Israel, Kedoshah, 
Why are you going to sin? Why are you not going to be modest? Please, HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves you. Just so you know, if you don't do it, you're going to go to Gehenom and Hashem is going to burn you and you're going to suffer severely. Why are you doing it? Set that tone. Simply trying to warn a person to stop listening to his evil inclination, to stop allowing that klipa, that cement, to stop him from seeing the truth for what it is. Some people require that. And unfortunately, Rabotai, for some it's not enough. For some, only the hand of a Kadosh Baruch Hu himself can actually break the klipa. Where they've made so many sins, and they're so addicted to their sin, and sometimes even that's not enough, and a Kadosh Baruch Hu has to beat up his own children time and time again, until they realize, I'm only warning you. Because here is a place you came to work. Work for a Kadosh Baruch Hu so you get an eternity of good. But if you don't work here for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and instead you work to fulfill your own desires and thereby become the servant of the Satan himself, then unfortunately no one will be able to help you after you leave this world. The details of the punishment are more horrible than the Holocaust times a million for eternity. And all HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to do is simply to wake you up so you start serving him and not the Satan. And if he has to break your body into 50 million pieces and you have to be in pain for the rest of your life just for you to do tshuva, let it be. At least I know you're still mine. You're suffering, you're in agony, you went through hell and back, but better be in hell in this world from those words and those insults and all of the other things than you be in hell for a single minute in Shemaim. When a person understands what I just said, then they're elated when they get a warning. I'd rather get the warning than the hand. I'd rather get the warning than the outcome of not listening to the warning. The people that have the most amount of fear of heaven also have the most amount of closeness to Hashem, most amount of happiness, most amount of excitement about serving a Baruch Hu, learning His Torah, knowing that this Torah is fire for my neshama. Why? Because it's either going to help me overcome those lusts, those desires, those filth that goes against Hashem, or it's going to glue me to Him even further. Needless to say, it's all amazing. And if this filth, if this grossness that they call all types of things that are going against Hashem is going to get in the way, let it burn, let it break, let it be destroyed in every way, shape or form, and me not sin even once. When a person understands there is this world, work. There's eternity. Enjoy the Shekhinah. Enjoy being next to HaKadosh Baruch Hu forever. All HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to clean the Shema. It's not his fault that you dirtied it. He gave you the rules. He gave you an open book test. And he expects you to pass. And one way or another, that soul will be cleaned. The question is whether you'll clean it or he'll clean it. It's much less painful when we clean it. Is it scary? Yes. But it makes a person elated, ecstatic, that they now have a purpose. So a person needs to help themselves. And the more they know the truth, the more they cleave to the truth, the closer it's going to bring them to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The Gemara in Yerushalmi says, the Gemara is poor in one place and rich in another. In one place you'll see that there's a certain subject that's being discussed, where there's only a single line being said. And then there is a different Gemara that talks about the same subject, but it gives you five pages. So in one place it's poor, it's only a single sentence, in another place it's rich. And therefore we don't learn Gemara, we don't learn Torah from a single place. We learn Sugyot by taking all of it. The, the oral Torah is a nervous system, that it's all connected. Now it may not look like the muscles on your feet can affect the uh, pain you have in your back, or even a twitch that you have next to your eye, is it just like you have a physical nervous system? Needless to say, there is a spiritual nervous system. And guess what? We also don't learn just from the Gmarot, because you also have the Chachamim that elaborated what it said. When you look at how they address a question, they literally, spiritually, make a surgery on the subject and they bring everything together before they pass in an actual halacha. So when somebody tells you, no, because it says so in this Gemara, or yes, because it says so in this Gemara, 
if they really mean that, if they think that's the reason, then that just simply means they actually don't know Torah, they don't know what wisdom is even, they don't know anything. So there is no debate to be made with such a person because they're literally too ignorant and arrogant to even debate with. The subject of Gehenom, there is no debate. There is no like a group of Chachamim that say maximum 12 months. Everyone that has studied the subject seriously knows it is not possible for Gehenna to be 12 months. Every single day, you make hundreds of decisions. Those decisions have an impact on your eternal life, not just your life here, not just your life that day, your eternal life. If a person understood how a Kadosh Baruch is judging a woman for being secluded with another man, needless to say, how he judges a woman that's promiscuous with another man, and not even promiscuous with a man, but she walks around immodestly and she causes other people to do certain things. And not just once, for 30 years of her life. So to give all of those women I just described the same maximum 12 months is not only stupid, it's evil. To say such a thing is only comes out from people who don't know anything beyond their ego and what they want it to be. What they want the answer to be. They want the answer to be 12 months because they know that they are criminals and they feel that if they say 12 months, therefore, no matter how much of a criminal they are, they only need to worry about a year's sentence. There's no logic whatsoever to such a person that is literally like of, of, of Am Yisrael because anyone understands one person murdered one person, another person murdered 50, another person raped five, another person violated Shabbat once, another person uh, is Hitler, another person is an idol worshiper but only for three years. All of them a year? All of them get the same sentence? So no normal person would think that, and needless to say, no lover of Hashem would ever say such a thing. About a Kadosh Baruch Hu, you think that a Kadosh Baruch Hu would make such a world that everybody gets the same sentence, no matter how much the person, how many crimes he makes, if he only makes crimes for the first 30 years of his life and not forever, or if he only makes crimes for one year, or if he only makes crimes for one day, if, if these people literally, if they thought to themselves and listened to the manure that comes out of their mouth, they would never want to speak again for saying such heretical things that are literally too stupid to discuss. But what can we do that people don't want to learn? Hence the reason why we said there's sometimes a klipa that's thicker and more difficult than cement. Those are those people where they're sure that their mistake, their heresy, and their stupidity is right. They're sure of it, just like you're sure that the sun will shine tomorrow. Anyone that studied the subject would know it's not possible for such a thing to work. Not even in this world does such logic work. No court in the world, even in third world countries, will give 10 different criminals the same exact punishment. No court in the world will give 10 different thieves the same type of punishment. Even if it's the same crime, they don't give you the same punishment. Why? Because he's black, he'll get 10 years. He's white, he's gonna get six months. He's something in between, but we don't like his father, 30 years. He's that guy, he gets two days. He's uh, rich, nothing. He goes free, in fact, give him a bonus for stealing. Even the same crime doesn't get the same type of uh, punishment. In this world, needless to say, in the world of truth, is it not possible to punish people the same thing? But you have to understand, they don't want to know the truth. They want to believe in their fairy tale, Harry Potter life, where everybody goes to heaven, no matter how much of a criminal they are, because they want to feel good about them being criminals. Everyone that they know remaining criminals, because they cannot look in the face of any of these people and actually tell them the truth because they know that they would be accusing them of what they themselves are guilty of. And since they don't want to change, they can't expect anyone else to. And therefore, the lie they feed themselves, by default, has to be fed to others. And the more it's fed to others, the more they start believing it themselves. So much so, that they reject the truth, even if Moshe Rabbeinu himself would come down from Mount Sinai and tell them, they would still deny it because they don't want it. And those people are literally in the worst possible shape, 
even worse than an atheist, even worse than an idol worshiper, even worse than some cats and dogs in the street that at least know who the Creator is. And those types of people, typically, it requires the hand of God Himself to break their klipa and try to save them. Masechet Sanhedrin, Kadosh Baruch Hu says to us that before Mashiach comes, you're going to give everybody an opportunity. And either they're going to do tshuva or He's going to send them Haman. What's Haman? Nebuchadnezzar, Hitler, Gog, all the worst possible things that broke all klipot. But that's what it took to wake certain people up and give them a chance. Even if that means they woke up five seconds before they got the death penalty, at least now they may have a share of the world to come after suffering a certain amount. Because at least now they know that there is a judge and that there, there is a God and he doesn't skip anything. What did the Hasidim actually say about punishment. Today, I have the Tanya, which is the foundation of Chabad, and I have Lekute Ma'aran, to clear up once and for all, does Hasidut believe in Gehenom or no? Is there suffering? Is there a physical place of fire or snow? We're simply trying to verify. Does Hasidut believe in a place of suffering that Hashem takes vengeance against the sinners or not? What the Tanya wrote in his beautiful, amazing book of Musal. What did he write here? What did Rabbi Nachman Mibreslim, what did he write? What did he say? What did the Baal Shem Tov say? What did the Magid Mezrit say? Double check, don't believe me. Because you're going to hear again after this shield, somebody else say, no, there's no gay no. He's crazy. He's fanatic. He's not understanding it. Okay. So you have to check. Chabad is Kodesh Kodeshim. Breslev is Kodesh Kodeshim. All Hasidu is Kodesh Kodeshim. It's the people that pretend to be them that are the problem. The beginning of wisdom, sphere of Hashem. If you're not afraid, petrified, from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, you're not sometimes crying because how scared you are. As soon as you understand who Hashem is, immediately you're afraid. Because you realize He could just simply turn off the button. If you're not afraid of that, there's something wrong with you. That means you don't, you haven't seen the hand of Hashem. So anyone that tells you don't be afraid or fear is for fools, that means he's a fool. The Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh says, a person has to be afraid of specifically punishment. The only fence that will stop the wicked from sinning is only if they're afraid of the punishment. The fire, the torture. As soon as a person knows there's a consequence for his actions, that's a horrible consequence that you cannot even imagine. He doesn't want it anymore. It's not worth it. When a person realizes that can happen to me if I do this, immediately that hate that he has cools off like ice. And he writes that he has to get himself used to this constantly on his mind until he gets to a point where he sees it himself that he literally has no desire to even return to this sin because of how scared he is of this sin. He says you have to constantly visualize these things because you're dealing with a Melech Malchei Amachim, the King of all kings, the Kadosh Baruch Hu, that there's everything is in his hand and nothing can escape it. As the prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 23, verse 24, is there is such a thing that someone can conceal themselves and then I not see them? Hashem says, everything he sees. Besefer Menachem Tzion, Drashat Shabbat Agadol. He says the following, it's impossible to do tshuva without being afraid of Hashem. If you're not afraid of Hashem, that means you don't know Hashem. You think He's like you. You think He's just going to let things go. You don't even feel bad for the sins you've made. You probably don't even know what sins you're making. He writes, Hashem Barach takes revenge against people that don't follow what He says. Rabbi Tzadok HaKohen Milublin writes the Sefer Tzadkat HaTzadik, Ot Nun Zayin, 57. The suffering that a person has over the sins that he's made and over his fear that he has of Gehenom, this will help his tshuva. From Shamayim, from heaven, they're reminding him of all of the sins that he's had in the past so he can suffer because of it in this world instead of the next. Now we're going to go into the main event. Tanya is the foundation of Chabad. Chapter 8. 
That is why the body must undergo the purgatory of the grave, where the soul is cleansed of stains in order to cleanse and purify it of the uncleanliness which it has received from the enjoyment of mundane things and pleasures which are derived from the uncleanliness of Klipat Noga and Jewish demons. When a person enjoys the materialism of this world more than he's supposed to, we're not even talking about he violates Shabbat here. We're talking about he's just enjoying the world a little too much. He says this person will have Chibut HaKev, will have a lot of suffering in the grave. Only one who has derived no enjoyment from this world all of his life will have some type of suffering in the grave. And then he continues, as for innocent idle chatter, you just decide to talk about baseball. He must undergo a cleansing of his soul to get rid of the uncleanliness of this klipa through it being rolled in kafa kela. What if it's lashon hara? What about if it's rechilut? What about that? The kafa kela alone is not enough for them to cleanse and remove the uncleanliness of the soul. They must go to Geno. You continue into the Tanya and to Igeret Tachuva, chapter 12. Well, the Tanya says when a person has suffering in his world, you should be happy about it. Their great and potent favor for the sinning soul to cleanse in this world and to redeem itself from purification in the next. The kindness of Hashem to give us suffering in this world, it saves us from the real suffering in the next world. Chabad does not believe in no gehenom. Besefer makom maim chayim. A person that thinks about evil things, about immodest things, and so on and so forth, he's going to end up getting suffered that's a thousand times worse than the pleasure that he got, and that's even before Geno. But if he knows the truth about the suffering that you get in Geno, he himself will destroy this, this thought. Just as it says, something that comes to kill you, you kill it first. This thought is trying to kill you. The Yitzhak is trying to kill you, kill it first. How? By knowing about the punishment. If you want to be a part of Judaism, you must believe in reward and punishment. The minimum of minimum that he has to do is put a protective fence. But part of our fence is the Torah Atzma. What Torah? Knowledge of what happens if we sin. That is the fence itself. So it's for your own best interest to know as much as possible about the punishment. A person that knows the consequences will easily determine it's not worth it. They little by little become a tzaddik or a tzaddika and they get the Ketel Torah. There's an evil inclination. It's a rock. You have to break it, you have to destroy it. But thereby learn how to use that evil inclination for good. Take the good out of it and use it. You have a very ambitious mentality chasing money. All types of desires. That's terrible, but it's not altogether terrible. You can use that same passion to go chase more Torah, more innovation in, 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 in the way to teach people, communicate with people, help people. Use that passion to help people get closer to Hashem. Use that addiction to learn more and do more good. Use the good of that Yetzirah, of that evil inclination to serve Hashem. It has to be destroyed and eliminated altogether. Your addiction to immorality, your addiction to drugs, your addiction to corruption, has to be eliminated. There is no other way. You cannot enter Gan Eden with blood on your hands. That evil inclination has to be destroyed. But there is a part of that evil inclination, the rock part, that you can't use good out of it. But why do both of them have to be destroyed? Why can't it just say, stop doing it? There's simply no way to get to the truth no way for us to accept the truth without breaking that rock. How do we break that rock and what does that have to do with Gehenom? The topic of this whole shiur. Everything. You see, Rabotai, some people simply, they won't accept it. They're addicted to their sins. They're addicted to their lifestyle. They like eating non-kosher food. They like being with imadis, immoral women. They like being the immoral woman. She likes walking around and having the whole neighborhood look at her. She likes it. So you tell her, God is so good to you. He gave you beauty. Why are you causing people to sin? Oh, it's their problem if they're sinning. They don't have to look. She doesn't see the damage she's causing in society. She doesn't realize that at least one or two couples are gonna fight because she walked by. She thinks that's good. 
And guess what? That girl that walked around immodest, walked around with different body parts showing no arms, no legs, she's gonna get a punishment. Just imagine what the woman that's walking around with a wig longer than the exile and a skirt shorter than our problems. Imagine what kind of punishment a woman's gonna get for a single act of immodesty. Needless to say, a single act of immorality where she actually acts on it and she doesn't realize for every single time, every single time, she will get punished severely. She doesn't realize that every look is a punishment. Every thought is a punishment. When he thought about her while he was with his wife, she will get punished for it. Meaning that the ramifications of her simple walk to the store are so horrendous that it's impossible to quantify how much damage she's causing to herself and how much damage she's causing to society. All of a sudden, the newly married man doesn't want to be a newly married man. Why? Because he figures maybe I can do better. And all of a sudden, the new, newly married woman doesn't want to have kids. Why? It'll ruin her body. She wants to continue looking like she's some steak 90 pounds. All of a sudden, the grandparents of that daughter cry to themselves for not giving the money to the parents to send the kid to a seminary that she can get proper education about modesty. All of a sudden, the parents are disappointed that their daughter that admires the celebrity acted like the celebrity, only that their daughter ended up pregnant at 14 years old with some guy they don't even know his name. And all of a sudden, there's a new baby in the world with no father. There are plenty of people that want to make all types of immoral crimes on their own and whoever's going to pay attention to them. And all of it is going to go to her account. She went to the store. She walked in the park. She acquired herself an endless amount of sins that can only be competed by a guy wasting seed. Because that's literally how many sins she acquired. And often, she'll even acquire more sins than the guy that wasted seed. Why? Because she led to him wasting seed. She was on a film, she was on a TikTok, PicPock, Facebook. She put up pictures on the internet. What? It's just my face! Yeah, but why are you puckering your lips? Oh, it's not cute? Okay, no, they'll find it very cute when they fry it like a steak. Oh, why do you talk like that? Because that's what's gonna happen. They'll hang you by your lips. Where does it say that? Meshit Chochma. Masechet Geno says exactly that. And other places of your body will be used as special ways to hang you. Why do you talk so harsh? Because that's how you break the rock. It is a requirement for you to believe in the punishment of Gehenom, thereby believing in the punishment of Chibuta Kevel, Kafakela, all of the horrible things. Why does everybody have to listen to it, follow it, engrave it into their heart? Because our desires, our commitment to sins, our passion for the wrong thing has turned our hearts into stone. Sometimes a stone heart for one sin, sometimes for a life of sins. But nonetheless, a heart of stone. And the only way to break that stone is with something violent. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu in His mercy says, I'm going to divinely inspire to give prophecies give teachings, insights, all across all spectrums of the Torah. They give you the details of punishment, of what happens after this life is over in this world. The reincarnation into animals, reincarnation into rocks, reincarnation into cats, like we reported in the story today. Reincarnation of a Jew into a Gentile body. Reincarnation of all types of strange things. Kafakelot having a neshama, destroyed in such a fashion that its only hope is to escape the destructive angels and enter into another human being just to park there for long enough time to avoid suffering just for a few moments called the dibuk to have a new role in the world instead of serving hashem by doing mitzvot serving hashem by being a demon and torturing people in nightmares and all types of other strange things why do the teachers we have 
our holy sages, our prophets, why do they talk about all this? Because the only way to break that rock, to make the metal explode, learn about what happened to others that went against the ship and ended up in Geno. And what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did to those women that walked around with their chest sticking out and tight clothes and lips puckered. Learn from the prophet Isaiah that saw Geno with his own eyes and how those very same women were hanging by those body parts in Geno. Learn what happened to all those men that ignored the teachings of Kedusha and wasted seed and therefore had to hang by their male members. And even the ones that didn't sin as much still had to have special angels have a spiritual surgery on that male member once they already arrived in the real world to remove all of the rust, spiritual rust that desecrated their bleat. Because they didn't finish their tshuva. They didn't do the tikkunim. So there has to be something. Learn about all of those horrific stories of kafakila. Horrific midrashim that talk about chibut kevil. Learn those scary stories of what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah in the Tower of Babel. Learn what happened at the time of Noah and how Hashem destroyed the world by melting the biggest giants into liquid. Learn the horrific details of what happens to a person who desecrates Hashem's name. Learn the details of what will happen to the rich who do not give the appropriate amount of tzedakah or do not give tzedakah to the appropriate places. Learn what the Chafetz Chaim said about such people. Learn about what Rabbi Akiva saw with his own eyes of people that came to this world and only he was able to see them burning. The more you learn those things, the bigger the dent you're going to make on that stone of a heart of yours that's connecting to the sins that got people to those places. We'll finalize it with what the prophet Isaiah prophesied to us and what the sages elaborated on it. It will happen as part of the salvation, the good, the good that will happen for all of us that do tshuva, that try our best to overcome the addictions, to overcome the evil, to overcome the heresy that's inside each and every single one of us in some form or another, to overcome the arrogance, the need for sins, to overcome all the things that are against the Shem. The Prophet says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will reward those people. I will cleanse you from your contamination and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He will change our hearts so that we will accept his word with complete love. Receive it. Receive all of those teachings that scare us, but we need it to constantly remind us what not to do. Learning about scary stuff makes you feel good because either it's warning you from things so you don't do them, or it's giving you encouragement that now that you're doing the good things, this bad stuff won't happen to you. It's like Adosh Baruch who promises us that he's going to help us if we help ourselves. We fight our evil inclination a little bit here and he'll destroy it altogether in the world to come. This too will be a teaching that strengthens each and every single one of us and gives us the courage to continue fighting our own evil inclinations own animalistic desires that are out of control, that are forbidden, that are abomination, our own corruption, whether it be in business or in the way we run synagogues and yeshivot, our own corrupt ideologies that are antithetical to the Torah, whether in a single house, synagogue, or an entire community. We all do enough to earn more truth from the Almighty. The Yetzirah works in all types of ways in order to get a person away from the direction that he wants to go. And one of the main tools that the Yetzirah works on in this generation is convincing everybody that there are no consequences. To such an extent that the consequences are minimized by telling people either that everyone goes to heaven at the end anyway, or the punishment is just embarrassment, or oh, it's a limited amount of time, it's so short, you know, what's 12 months out of a trillion years? So they minimize it to such an extent it is as if it does not exist. 
Now, of course, Besiyat Yishmaya, over the last eight or so years, we've worked very hard to bring the consequences in front of people's eyes from the sources. Most people, it was enough for them. But then the Yitzhak attacked again. What did he say? Rashid Chochma? What did he say? Gemara? Midrash? No, you don't have to believe every Midrash. Yeah, but it says Gehenom spread over there. No, no, he's misunderstanding it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's about Jewish, he doesn't know anything. And he convinced you that everything that warmed you up again to go serve Hashem, to become modest again, to leave the boyfriend, to leave the girlfriend, to leave the sins, to leave, uh, leave and abandon all the garbage, they convinced you, nah, you're making a mistake. Rabotai Karim, today this Yetzara has messengers. Those messengers will sometimes have a beard, sometimes have a kisuro, sometimes they look religious, sometimes they don't look religious. They come in all shapes and sizes. All of them have the same intention, to cool you off. To cool you off from the path that you already got on. But you know what everybody can see? You know what everybody can feel? Suffering. That's something that is universal in every language. Everyone is afraid of suffering. Everyone has their life revolved around the fear of suffering in one form or another. They go into relationships because they suffer from loneliness or they're afraid to suffer from loneliness. They make certain business transactions because they're either suffering from poverty or they're afraid to suffer from poverty. They do all types of things because they're afraid that they're going to be missing in action. And suffering, whether it exists or it's simply in a person's mind, is the primary driving force for why people make their decisions in life. Everyone is afraid to suffer. But what happened is, Rabotai, the Yetzirah is so clever, he's so smart, he convinced everyone the suffering is limited. And the Yetzirah tried to make sure that everybody just doesn't even think of how punishment is actually something you're obligated to think about every single day. And in fact, when you actually understand the words you're saying in prayer, what you read in every parasha, in every sidu, what is literally across all spectrums of our holy Torah, you're constantly reminded of the consequences. You may have not noticed it, but you will notice it tomorrow. Where in the morning prayer it says, Az panim le The arrogant, they go to Geinom. Why? Because if they're arrogant, that means they're not going to change. If they're not going to change, certainly they're not going to do Hashem's will. And that's good morning. Chachamim said, already you have to know, Geinom is right next to you. And it mentions it countless times in the prayer. When a person has Yirat Shemayim, when a person has fear of the Almighty, they go on autopilot of doing what Hashem says. The Kadosh Baruch Hu shows Moshe Rabbeinu Geinom. Moshe says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu after he sees this, who's punished in this place? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe, the wicked ones, the ones that rebel against me. Prophet Isaiah, the last verse, chapter 66, verse 24, where it says, And they will go out and see the corpses of the men who rebelled against me, for their decay will not cease and their fire will not be extinguished. So this is one of the verses that's a source from the Torah that says that there is a form of punishment that is forever. Moshe Rabbeinu sees Geinom and the Midrash says Moshe Rabbeinu began to become petrified of Geinom. Moshe Rabbeinu sees Geinom, he's scared to death. Why is Moshe Rabbeinu scared to death? But the average person walking around today, you ask him, are you scared of Geinom? What is that? Why should I be scared? Average lecture online makes it sound like a good place. So you see that there's a lot of confusion. Now the Efet Torah says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu shows Moshe Rabbeinu all of the criminals in every generation and also all of the judges. Why does it say criminals, judges, why does it specify? It says because sometimes the judge is the criminal. And sometimes the entire generation is full of criminals that are sometimes leaders. It also says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu matches the speakers, the rabbis, the leaders, the judges with every generation. To remind us that whatever we have is what we asked for, is what we deserve. So we can't complain, oh, this is a weak generation, therefore I'm allowed to do, no. What we have is what we asked for. The key is to know that this little bit of information is enough for us to ask if it's in a Midrashim. And it's also in a Gemarot. What's the only reason why people would say that Genom is not mentioned? And they're not talking about it. It's going to say, no, it's not our way to teach about punishment, it's not our way to teach about consequences, we want to teach you to love God and be happy. See some, well, do you teach halacha? Yes. Do you teach Shulchan Aruch? Yes. Do you disagree with Shulchan Aruch? Not allowed to be. Why? Because if you're an Orthodox Jew, Shulchan Aruch is, that's it. 
It's the end all be all. There's a few customs different between Ashkenazim, Sfaradim, but the basic foundation is exactly the same. Sometimes somebody would tell me, listen, we Ashkenazim, we don't learn about consequences. It's more of a Sephardi thing. What I'm going to do now is solve the last equation. To eliminate any doubt left for anybody to justify not speaking about consequences because where is Genom in Alacha? Not Midrashim, not Gmarot. We did that already. The question is, is there a difference between a Midrash and Alacha, a Gmarah and Alacha? Yes, a world of difference. But once something is Alacha, that's it. That's like Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, Moshe Rabbeinu, the end. There is no further discussion. How much does the Torah mention the subject of genome and consequence? Is it just some strange thing that is in my mind and I'm the only one that likes to talk about it? Like I have some fixed fixation about it? Or is this the way of the Masoret of Am Yisrael? That we actually have to be like the rest of society and not only think of consequences of missing out, of doing wrong in business, missing out doing wrong in marriage, missing out doing wrong in relationship, but also missing out doing wrong in our purpose of life. We're all living based on fear everywhere else in our life. Clearly everyone knows that there is a certain amount of fear that is necessary for us to exist. Is that also in Alakha, which is the rule book that tells us yes or no? No debates. No, there's different opinions, yes or no. In the Talmud Bavli, the word Gehenom appears no less than 133 times. But that's just the word Gehenom, not the subject of Gehenom. In the Yerushalmi, 15 times. The Tul Bet Yosef, 13 times. The Bet Yosef, 14 times. In Sifre Chasidut, no less than 1,000 times. Rav Avadiyaz Yebiyah Omer, 76 times. The halachic foundation of Judaism discusses Genom much more often than they discuss pretty much anything else. The Rambam in Ilchot Yesodea Torah, chapter 5, halacha number 4. The Rambam says, one who could escape and flee from under the power of a wicked king and fails to do so is like a dog who returns to lick his vomit. He is considered as one who worships a false god willingly. He will be prevented from reaching the world to come and he will descend to the lowest levels of Genom. This is a lacha, this is not a midrash. Where the Rambam says outright, you have an opportunity to avoid a sin. The Torah obligates us to avoid certain sins under all costs. If somebody tells you, either die or violate Shabbat, you have to violate Shabbat. But if they tell you die or worship a foreign god, you have to die. But if they tell you, listen, either violate Shabbat or give me all of your money, you have to give all the money. Now, if you have an opportunity to avoid making that sin, you can run away. But you choose not to, either because you're afraid or whatever other reason there is. The Rambam says not only is that itself turned into a sin, but it's the worst possible thing that a person can do. It's the equivalent of idol worship. And it brings him to the lowest level of Gehenna. Meaning not only does the Rambam mention Gehenna in Alacha, but he even specifies that there is levels in Gehenna. The Rambam in Ilchot Sanhedrin, in chapter 23, Alacha number 8, talks about the dinim, how a, a judge, a Jewish judge, has to behave when he's about to make a judgment. The Rambam says that a judge should always see himself as if the sword is drawn on his neck, and Genom is open before him. Meaning that the judge is supposed to think of Genom while he's actually doing his job. That if he judges the wrong way, he's going to get punished. Severely. Now the tool mentions Genom 13 times. In Ilchot Filin, where he says that the Yud has to be drawn in a certain way, where there is a pointy tip on top and a pointy tip on the bottom. If your tefillin do not have a pointy tip, you're not following one of the alachot. Why is it important? To remind people that if they sin, they don't put on tefillin, they're going to go to Gehenom. The yud is pointy on the bottom to remind people that the neshama is going to go to Gehenom. What about on top? If they're righteous, but they still made some sins, just know it's pointy on top to remind you that even if you went to Gehenom for something else, eventually you're going to come out because you put on tefillin. That's why the yud is drawn that way. And this is mentioned a couple of times in the two. And he mentions it in many other places of why there is a need to know Genom according to Allah. In Ilhot Kriyat Shema, in Siman 62 in the 2, 
He says that when a person has kavana, when they say Kriyat Shema, they're relieving themselves for a certain amount of time that they would be supposed to be in Genom. This is not a Midrash, this is not a story, it's not an Agada, it's not a fairy tale. This is a law in the Torah. The Rama in the Shulchan Aruch mentions Genom much more than Rabbi Yosef Karo. In Or Chaim, in Ilchot Shabbat, in Siman 291, there's a lachot about Suda Shlishit, something that the average person doesn't even know exists. The Rama says, in the time of Mincha, that's right next to Arvit. During that time where it's not quite Arvit, don't drink water. He says, because that's the time that the Neshamot that are in Genom right now. But they kept Shabbat. On the way to Genom, they give them some water. If you drink the physical water here, it takes away from the spiritual water they're supposed to get. So you cause them suffering. Don't drink water during this window of time. Then you have Yoredea and Ilchot Avelut. Siman 376. It's a big chesed to give a person that his parents died that year to be chazan on Motzei Shabbat. Because that's the time where the neshamot go back to Geinom. Because he's chazan, he relieves his parents from Geinom for that day. Meaning that when you see how often the Chachamim mention this, this is standard Judaism. To the point where when a person does not understand this, they can easily justify every single crime under the sun. It does exist. The Chachamim wanted to make, make sure that everybody understands that there is a consequence for doing so. Now, what is the conclusion of all of this? Rabbi Ephraim says, a person should never be scared of speaking about Geinom or hearing about Geinom. Rather the opposite. They should be scared of somebody who doesn't speak about it. They should be scared about somebody that refuses to listen to it. If you wanted to become a doctor, and then I told you, okay, listen, you have to take this course, and this course is gonna be most critical step of your learning, but we have to options. We have one professor on this side of the building and another professor on that side of the building. Choose whichever one you want. Naturally, if you're a smart person, you say, okay, what's the difference between the professors? So you ask some people that went to that class, you know what's the difference between two professors? Yeah, yeah, huge difference. The guy on this side, he's the funniest guy in the world. He's so funny, you're gonna laugh so much. We really have a good time. Once in a while, he brings beer. W what about medicine? Well, let's talk about medicine. What about the other guy? Oh, the other guy? He's boring. And now sometimes, not just boring, he's scary too. Tells you about all types of stuff. What, what, what is he, what stuff, what stuff? Tells you all the consequences of what if a doctor fails, he can kill people, the consequences of not putting the right prescription or the right medicine or not cutting appropriately or not numbing appropriately. I mean, the guy's just miserable. I don't know, he always talks about negative things. Now a wise person, which professor does he go to? If he wants to graduate as a clown, he wants to graduate as a comedian, he goes to the first one, to the funny guy. But if he wants to be a doctor, he has to go to the other one. Because the other one's gonna teach him the consequences so he could avoid them. When a person runs away from learning about the consequences of their actions, that means that they have simply accepted the fact that they are incapable of changing. But the truth is, is that Every one of us knows that we could all change. We just need enough inspiration, enough motivation. If we're gonna rely on our past to motivate us, it can't motivate us forever. The only thing that's gonna get us forward is by getting us to learn enough Torah that we realize that if we don't continue to learn, if we don't continue to grow, we're simply gonna fall in and be prey to our own foolishness. And a person needs to know that learning about the consequences is simply a necessity in all aspects of life. Once a person applies these types of teachings to their life, to their Torah, then they're able to change. If a person lives in this world and he doesn't do what a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, he doesn't keep Shabbat, you know, she's not modest, they don't eat kosher food, they don't do what a Kadosh Baruch Hu says. And not just one time, their whole life. And they die like this. And of course, a Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want to punish a soul forever. He wants to give everybody a chance to get to the highest stage. But if they mess up, they can't be given the same exact chances again. They have to be given a different chance. If you messed up in this family, next time you're going to get a different family. But that family in the first time was a family of Jewish people. The next time it could be a family of Goyim, meaning you have to come to the world, reincarnate into the world as a Goyim. With your objective is to become a Jew. That's your goal in life. Why could such a thing happen? Because maybe in your previous life, you married a Goyim, you married a Goya. You're gonna come back as them. With an actual objective and purpose that you have to become a Jew. You have to undo all the mistakes you made. But sometimes people make certain sins for example, she decides she wants to have a, a nice boyfriend from Peru that's not Jewish. 
he wants to have a nice girlfriend from Tahiti. That's not Jewish. So what happens? The Gemara says that if a Jew goes with the Goya, she'll be stuck to him like a dog with a objective to fix himself. Rabbi Chaim Palachi says one of the reasons of why Kadosh Baruch Hu has this mitzvah of Birkat Ha'ilanot is because there are different types of reincarnations. Sometimes the Jew can reincarnate as a goy. Sometimes the Jew can reincarnate, the male can reincarnate as a female. The female can reincarnate as a male. Ashkenazi can reincarnate as Sephardi. Sephardi can reincarnate as Ashkenazi. You hated Sephardi, but you are Ashkenazi, you'll reincarnate as Sephardi. You'll feel the hate. Midah ken dege midah, measure for measure. A person can come back as a tzomeach, can come back as a tree, can come back as a plant, with a tikkun that's only possible if somebody goes to that tree and does the birkat ha'ilanot. Don't just think, oh, it's a nice mitzvah, Hashem's going to be happy I made this mitzvah, first, second, third time in my life, tenth time in my life, wow, oh Hashem. No, think also, I have an opportunity right now to mamash save a neshama. Take this neshama from this tree, and then just give it another chance. Hopefully it comes back as a human being. Hopefully it uh, fixes itself. So this Rabotai Karim is a reality. That there are souls that are trapped and reincarnated in the soil, and plants, and fields. There's a pasuk in the Torah that talks about those people that came back as a stone. It says that there are these stones that are screaming. Did you ever see a stone scream? Did you ever hear it scream? But their stones are screaming. You just can't hear them because Hashem did not give you the ability to hear everything that's around you. Because if you did hear or see everything that's really around you, the world would not be the same. You'd go crazy. But there's a pasuk in the Torah that says these screaming stones. Chamim say, what are these screaming stones? Because these are the stones that actually have neshamot in them. So for all of those people that don't like to believe in the mystical aspects of the Torah, then you have to probably pick a different religion because the Torah is full of mysticism. It's full of mysticism. But from this mysticism, we also learn that the there is schar ve'onesh. There is reward and punishment. If we do good, we will get good. If we do bad, we will get bad. Simple. Reincarnation is part of a, the reward and punishment system, more the punishment than the reward. When a soul completes his mission, it no longer has a reason to be in this world. The bad has to come back to this world. Bad can come back simply as a uh, another person. They would look the same to a certain extent, meaning they would have a similar image. All of the carnations of a person throughout all of history are similar looking. And you can actually see this in different books that have tracked down the pictures of specific uh, people that were leaders within a generation. And you'll see that they actually have a replica today. Like for example, Putin. Putin from Russia has looks like uh, one of the major Roman Caesars. Zuckerberg also looks like somebody famous uh, from uh, five, six hundred years ago. Uh, and a lot of famous people have a, uh, a look-alike in history. But not look-alike, oh, it's similar, like it's identical, just different mustache. A person goes to this carnation and he has a chance to fix what he didn't fix before. But sometimes that reincarnation is a heavier punishment than usual. There are certain Mekubalim that can deal with this stuff, but unfortunately there are certain people that hate these type of stories because they think this is mumbo jumbo. Funny thing is, is that our sages talk about it across the entire Torah. You look at all of the uh, the work of the Arizal, talks about it constantly. Talk about all of the uh, Rabbi Daftaya, just uh, we're not talking about a couple hundred years ago, a hundred years ago. His whole book is full of stories of him talking to different souls. Uh, you look at the entire Zohar, you're going to see countless stories like this. You look at the Gemara, countless stories like this. But people have a hard time believing in reincarnation because they look at it only as a negative thing. Actually, it's a positive thing. There are different levels, a different punishment. There's also different time frames. Some people can be there forever. It depends on what the sin is. What do you plan on doing with your life? Are you planning on serving Hashem or no? If you're not planning on serving Hashem, then in reality, you're probably already living Gainom in this world anyway. So just expect to go from your unhappiness to much, much worse. Now, if you are really serving Hashem, then focus on serving Hashem. Why? Because if you're truly serving Hashem, you're so busy that you're trying, you're, you're purifying your Neshama nonstop. You end up falling in love with Hashem. 
and you're so busy, your whole life is Hashem. From morning to night, there's no breaks. Another way to serve Hashem, I'm going. I'm excited. Now I'm going to be perfect. Even Genom becomes good. Why? I'm so busy serving Hashem my whole life. If going to Genom for a week is going to perfect everything, it's worth it. And that's what the Baal Shem Tov was trying to say to us for the last few hundred years. Even if they would tell me in Shemayim to go to Genom, I tell them, Hashem said, I'm going. Because I was busy my whole life serving Him. And that's really what the sages, in essence, imply when they said Genom is a washing machine. It's a washing machine for those that serve them their whole life to perfect that last 1% because it makes you shalim. Makes you shalim means complete. We have to get busy with Avodat Hashem. The Chachamim say this is not about rebuke of a rabbi. This is not the rebuke of some book. This is a rebuke of a Kadosh Baruch Hu when we go up to Shamaim. And he himself will tell you, why'd you do it? Why'd you go against me? As it's written in the book of Psalms, Psalm 50, verse 21. These have you done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was like you. What does it mean you thought I was like you? You thought just because I'm not punishing you, I agree that you're violating Shabbat. But I will now punish you and lay clearly before your eyes, meaning I'll show you every single sin right before I punish you. Then the next verse, Rabotai says this. Understand this now, you who have forgotten God, lest I tear you into pieces and there be none of you to rescue. This is Teilim, Rabbutai. This is literal. Hashem Himself is telling us. It's not a game. He's telling us you sinned and you thought that it was okay because I didn't punish you. It's not okay. No, now. Tshuva, today, every day, right now, everybody go home. Everybody watches the shiur today, tomorrow, next year, next month, wherever it is. You do tshuva today. Today you do tshuva. Don't wait till tomorrow. Today already go hatanu, aviru, pashan. Because if you don't, there may be nothing to save. Last Chidush to give you a concept of how important you is. Hashem is supernatural. You and me are natural. Death is a natural event for all of us. Everyone that's lived died. Everyone that's alive will die. Resurrection of the dead is supernatural. In a Torah, someone that's righteous is considered alive. Someone that's wicked is considered dead even while they're alive in this world. They're still considered dead in the eyes of Hashem. When you do tshuva, stick to Hashem. You're doing something that's supernatural. And the reason why it's supernatural, you're literally reviving your soul. We were dead as sinners and we're alive as Baalei Tshuva. No one cares about yesterday. Doesn't matter who your father is, your mother is, your neighbor is, your rabbi is, your this, your that. It doesn't make a difference. Today you do Tshuva. Whatever it is that you're doing that's not in the Torah, that's not good, today you do Tshuva. Everyone knows it's hard, but you gotta do it anyway. The consequences are too dear. But the beauty is that when you do tshuva, you're a superhero. Because you're literally doing something supernatural. You're bringing something that's dead and making it alive again. So it's a supernatural action by a natural person who made a decision to put the supernatural, to put Hashem in control. Tshuva is good for you. No one gains more than you. And like Rabbi Yisraeli Salat, Allah Shalom said, even if it was simply avoiding the fire of Genom, and that was the reward itself and nothing else, it's still worth it to do tshuva. Because the punishment is dear. So Be'ezrat Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will have mercy on us and open our hearts to do tshuva, to overcome Ayetzara, to overcome all of the evil inclinations that we have and realize and visualize and understand how horrible it is to go against them. Because once you open up the door and you start doing tshuva, Hashem does the rest. You are natural, doing something supernatural, and therefore the supernatural will take charge. And Be'ezat Hashem, get us all to Gan Eden. So all of this will just be a simple shiur. It's a distant memory of bad things that could have happened, but never did. God is not finished with us in this life. He has projects for us. But if there is an afterlife like I believe, people shouldn't go through life being indifferent to this. They ought to do everything they can to learn about whether there's an afterlife and try to find out what it's like and how it informs day-to-day -day life here on Earth. All sorts of deep truths about the world seem to be understood only by a relatively small number of people. Well, on the Jewish end, there are three aspects of eschatology, that the Messiah would come first, there would be resurrection of the dead, and the final stage would be the world 
to come. It's, it's a natural extension of the idea that you're not locked inside your head. And that the moment you make the leap of faith, or maybe the leap of evidence, that our, our intentions affect the world around us, and affect what other people think. Once you find out that your real identity is way beyond anything in space-time, if you can awaken yourself into the awareness of your bigger identity now, you will know that that is who you really are. So you get a cow tongue. You're correlating or tying the energy of whoever's talking gossip to that tongue. Uh -huh. And that the more that they would talk slander and gossip, the more bad luck that they would bring upon themselves. So whether we like it or not, we're all on a trajectory. I'm the doctor who tries to prevent people from dying, and I know I'm going to die one day. I, I see myself one day being that patient with another doctor like myself taking care of me, knowing that the time has come. So going through the science of it, we don't have all the answers today, but I think we've made enormous strides to answer the question of what happened to our time. What really matters in life, what's most important, what do we, I want to be doing with this small amount of time I have, and how do I want to relate to people knowing that they and I will die? If spiritual traditions and psychological traditions both urge us not just to know we're going to die as a nice, interesting idea, but also to take it very seriously and to live our lives in that light. Thank you.